Hello and welcome to this CodeBuddies.org live coding session. CodeBuddies is a global community of amazing people who help each other become better at software development through conversations on Slack and peer-to-peer -peer organized study groups and virtual hangouts. We're going to be working on the Western Friend website, which we've been working on for over a year now, and a lot of features, a lot of progress. We're kind of uh, coming to the end of the main uh, minimum viable project. Uh, one caveat, this video is a live coding video, meaning uh, it's like watching video gamers doing live streaming. Uh, I will actually be writing code, uh, scratching my head, figuring things out, solving problems, making mistakes. These are not short videos. If you're uh, just wanting to see the summary of the changes, I make recap videos, uh, which are much shorter. But if you're interested to see Oh, the thought process and sometimes the interactions with um, other people who stop by the stream, uh, then this video might be interesting for you. Uh, could be good if you just put it on in the background and uh, do some other activities and uh, just listen. There's kind of interesting things that occur sometimes during the live coding sessions. So I haven't been working on the Western Friend website for just a little bit. I stepped away from the code. Uh, but we've reviewed, we've started a more thorough review process um, where Mary Klein, the editor of Western Friend, is um, going through the features with me and we're finding little things I, like oversights or small improvements that could be made. And so I think I'm going to start off this session, see if I can get a little momentum by going through a few of the issues on GitHub. But one of the big issues I'd like to work on, and if I get enough speed, either in this session or the shortly uh, upcoming session, would be um, on our deep archive feature, which we've been currently working on, getting sort of a, a faceted search f so people can filter the deep archive by year. Uh, that faceted search should probably give us a count of the issues that appeared in the year. So it's actually going to be um, a proper search faceting rather than just a filter. Uh, in any case, I don't know if I'll get to that today. I'll try my best, but if you, we'll see how much difficulty I have uh, just getting through these little lower level maintenance tasks. So the first thing I um, think would be good is Heroku. We, uh, we're not using Heroku anymore. For what it's worth, I'm using uh, Daku to deploy. Um, the reason Heroku is interesting and a good way to start a project is it makes it real easy to deploy. You have a couple of commands you, you run to do your common maintenance tasks, like deploying a, a server uh, or an app to the server and uh, running commands on the server, and it'll even automatically deploy when you have changes to your master branch. Um, but the pricing, the Heroku pricing, is it doesn't change. Uh, it's not, I don't think, competitive. Um, and it's like you have a free tier and then a, an entry-level tier, which is a few, like 10 euros a month or $10 a month. And then it just jumps up to like $50 a month right off the bat. Um, and we're honestly looking at hosting. We'll probably, probably at least be paying $20 a month for the hosting of this Western Front website. Um, but we're just looking at DigitalOcean. It's more competitively priced. They, they even changed their pricing a little bit to give you more resources for your money every so often. I think Heroku is just static. So I want the Heroku expensive uh, experience, but a little less expensive hosting. So this Daku uh, gives us that experience, and DigitalOcean makes it easy to deploy. We've just been using DigitalOcean for a long time, uh, so I'm very familiar with it. But it runs on... Um, you know, Linode or uh, let's see, all sort of any, you just you need a VPS, virtual private server to run it. So we won't be touching based on that. Uh, I might be able to have a live coding session where we look at Daku and how, how to configure your Django project. Uh, it is pretty um, convenient. I had a little trouble just getting set up. Uh, so there are some gotchas. Here it is, Django Heroku. So let's go ahead and remove this. Um, it was even uh, causing these weird errors because it was including, it was a, instead of using PG 2 binary as a dependency, it was um, 
we were having to build Psycho PG2, uh, which is not ideal. So let's just go ahead and get rid of it now. So we're gonna go into poetry, shell. We're gonna remove Django Haroku. Now this DJ database URL, we're gonna lose that. That's kind of interesting. We're also losing Psycho PG2 and White Noise. So it looks like, um, you know, it came with a few convenience um, packages. We haven't looked at how to, we're gonna be handling static files. So I might come back and reinstall White Noise later. Uh, we're not even using Psycho PG2. <laughs> Django has its own ORM. I don't believe uh, it needs Psycho PG2 under the uh, under the cover, so to speak. And I'm not sure why Django Heroku needed it. It was just like dragging along its extra dependency and perhaps its sub dependencies and introducing a build step where we had to actually compile the software. So yeah, it's just not a good uh, uh, just not a good experience, so to speak. This DJ database URL allows you, instead of in your config file, instead of defining, I'll have to double check how we're defining ours too so that it's not gonna break right away, but uh, let's go to base settings and look for the database settings here. Here we are. So it allows you to use, um, I don't have an example to show you, but uh, it allows you to use, well, sort of Psycho PG style um, database URLs where you have the protocol, so Postgres colon slash slash, username, uh, I think colon, password at server um, colon port uh, slash database. Uh, so that's called the database URL. I think it's just a, a normalized um, sort of schema that's commonly adopted in a lot of um, projects. I should probably just show you the docs here. From PyP. Yeah, the re readme should render here. Um, so yeah, here. So you can usually either configure your database by keyword arguments or by creating a Postgres slash slash type. Um, doesn't really give a great example in any case. We're losing those packages, um, but I don't think that should affect our uh, project and in fact let me make a branch real quick so we're removing I forget what's called Django Heroku there we go and I'll make sure we're same as our remote master I think we are now I can commit this It's just nice to have fewer dependencies, to be honest, and less you know, things to break or maintain or consider how they work. It did make it easy, and Heroku again you know, does make it easy to run uh, your, your code in the cloud, get it up and running there, and Django Heroku even uh, made it so much easier to handle your static files and all that stuff. Um, we just weren't using Heroku to the extent uh, it was, uh, it can be used, and we were in fact losing our static files every time we deployed, redeployed, so that was a frustration. Cool. So we just removed the one dependency, but then Poetry also manages these other dependencies, so we are getting rid of Django Heroku, Psycho PG, 2, White Noise, I don't know if it has any other sub dependencies. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, I'm not sure who owns Heroku now, but I'm not sure if they're too concerned about competitive pricing. Heroku. Like Salesforce owns them or something, but maybe I'm mistaken. Yeah, it's a Salesforce company, and I don't think Salesforce cares about competitive pricing on things. They're, they've just got cash coming out to Wazoo, so to speak. So we're not using 
Django database or the, the URLs. We don't have to worry about that, but let's go ahead and push this up. I don't know if you can see that. I'll, I have two remotes now. I've got GitHub remote and then the Docu remote. Let's grab a little bit of tea. I've got some gunpowder green tea, I guess, in honor of the Chinese New Year. <clears throat> and with a little bit of... Um, Sadness to the people who are there suffering from uh, the outbreak of coronavirus and are in quarantine. So just want to kind of acknowledge that. Okay. So we've got a pull request. And I don't really have anybody to review these pull requests. It's a single developer project. I'm Kind of holding my self accountable for having clean code and things like that. Um, but at least with these pull requests, by keeping consistent with the development process, it uh, makes things easier to track down. If we do have any other people who are interested in contributing to the project, they can see what's going on. So we'll rebase and merge this. Uh, I'll just really quick, I'm not, so I'm not really testing it thoroughly here, am I? All right, so yeah, I need to run that test. And I'm just importing it, it's not gonna work. Settings base.py. Let me see what I'm using actually. So, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and merge this now. Rebase and merge. So many lines. I guess there are so many of these. These hashes for the cycle PG wheel. So Django. Uh, Heroku is going to be complaining about deploying now. We'll just have to close that account. We were considering paying it, and honestly, our budget is around, um, you know, $50 a month for running this site. Not much more. We're not, like, a super wealthy. Uh, Western Friends is a nonprofit. They don't have a lot of subscribers, um, you know, relative to other magazines or something like that. And so the money is important that we spend it effectively, but we're not like so, um, our budget's not so tight that we don't, we can't afford uh, to pay for tech. And we just have more important um, services that we're running. Well, the website's a very important service, I should say, but we also have a next cloud and things like that, which is, um, that's running around $40 a month for hosting. All right, cool. So. Got that deployed. Ah, uh, you know, I just didn't close the issue anyway, or it didn't link the issues. Like I said, I've been away from this project for a little bit. 137. I'm sort of getting a little bit rusty just on my GitHub workflow.
This is cool. When you refer to an issue from a pull request and then you merge that pull request, GitHub will automatically close the related issue. And in this case, I've merged it already, so it didn't trigger that action. So I'll just close it now. All right, so one less issue. We'll go down a little bit here. Let's see. I have this slim select bug. I believe I worked it out. Let's see if I log in. Um, I need to be running the site. For tech, dummy password. Mm. There it is. Um, Deep archive setup. I believe I worked this issue out to slim select. Oh, this is a different issue. I'm not going to do that today. This is the one I was fixing the other day. Let me just double check. I believe I got the markup worked out there. And that is on the library. So we go to Wagtail Admin under the pages, the library page, if I view that live. Yeah, these labels are now fixed. Uh, it's not using, I don't think it's using Slim Select here now. Which might be in a permanent less is more. Slim Select is a really nice uh, widget with multi-select capabilities and filtering and things like that, but for these, it, might be better just to stick with a simple material bootstrap type thing. Make sure they're all consistent. I just don't have any library items, so there's no categories. Uh, let's just close this. Let's see. when I fixed that somehow. Lost the thread there. This is probably an important bug to fix right now. <coughs> Let's take a look here. So, community, let me see if there's people or memorials. Yeah, I need to be able to scaffold this uh, site a little bit better. I don't know, maybe the dummy content. Uh, 
Ah, uh, yes. So actually, I didn't want to define that memorial. The bug here is uh, let's reproduce it. So first, I need to add the memorials to the menu so I can just get there easily. Library memorials. And then I need to make sure that the memorials are set to show in menus, which they're not by default. Okay, so now if I go to the memorials, if I refresh, so you see that it's not appearing in the menu yet. But now if I refresh, we've got memorials page, uh, which doesn't have any intro text, but it's showing an intro block and if I filter, let's just say a filter that's going to come back with no results. I can't now clear the filter. Uh, so we need a way of, of getting that back. So this is a bug. So let's go ahead and um, always show memorials filter. Now if we go to memorials, templates, the index page, essentially this filter just needs to come out of there, I think should be fine. Oh, I got a mismatched div there. It's, it's a little bit worrisome. List group. Oh, there's my mismatched. Let me just step back here. All right, so if memorials, then we're going to show this whole card thing. So that's, we got a card. Ah, so that's what we need. I'm going to put it right here. Get a card hitter, header, a list group. If memorials, there's a list group. Else, we need just a card body. That should give us the spacing there. Yeah, it's a little cleaner. I think this more or less fixes that bug. Um, so if I clear the filters, then we got that. And uh, so if I just you know, I get a working filter that works there, follow up to friends meeting, that'll work still. But if I, yeah, so good, not too bad. It will fix. Uh, 
and I'm going to push to the origin branch, origin on GitHub. So, a few lines of code, just moving that conditional statement around so it doesn't exclude the filter bars when there are no memorials in the page context. That was allowing the user to get stuck. They would make a filter that was invalid or wouldn't return anything, and then they couldn't clear the filter in a way that was intuitive without hacking the URL bar or going to the navigation menu or something like that. So now we fixed that. We'll probably come back and improve all of these pages in subtle ways as well. Go ahead and check out master. I'll refresh master. Let's check the issues. What else can we do here? Low hanging fruit issues. Just trying to blaze through a few, get it back in the swing of things. Um, this is a bug, this is a good one to try. Uh, when we're searching, so when we fill in this memorial's form, here and end up submitting this with these criteria. Uh, in the receiving view, the more or less the wagtail page has a context function where uh, overriding the git context, I think, is uh, where it's at. Um, it's performing a case sensitive search. So we just want to make it insensitive so that capitalization doesn't matter. Um, I don't remember exactly how Mary was having troubles with it, but it makes sense. It should just be as simple, simple as possible. So if I look for the memorials index page, then here's the get context. And what we're doing in here, we're filtering by the facets. Okay. So we have these two facets. We have a title, a memorial meeting title. And we're, so this filter is apparently defaulting to case sensitive. So I think this is just straight uh, out of Django core. Insensitive, and I have Googled this before. Uh, mm. Ah, so it's just a matter of changing. Instead of using contains, You can use insensitive contains. Oh wow, one character difference. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Let's go ahead and check it out. So we got someone, family. Let's. I'll just reproduce the bug real quick with contains. And if I refresh, just uh, shouldn't matter. But and now if I search for, let's say, someone with a lowercase s. Hmm. Oh, no, no. I don't know why this didn't crop up. Hmm. Seems to be working. Let me just double check again. I, I have saved the file with the contains, not I contains. Hmm. <clears throat> now when I deploy this on Docu, it may be using Postgres, but yeah, I just don't know. I'm going to use this I contains because I believe that's that's the issue. Wow. I need to do case intensive search. And 
it should work it's the same now. So here it's good to point out where uh, here's an, a case where it's a bug in my local development. Uh, I can't manifest. I can't reproduce it because I'm using a different database than in production. And so the guideline that is in two scoops of Python and a general guideline for the for Django development is used the same. Um, you know, environment and same database locally for development as you do in production. So you don't have these weird bugs that, you know, you don't catch until they're deployed. <laughs> but there's trade-offs with that as well. In a way, you know, SQLite lets you get up and running and just start developing right away and focusing on your idea. And sometimes these bugs aren't necessarily showstoppers that um, you can fix them and in due time when they're discovered. So yeah, if you can make your development experience easier, particularly the on onboarding step in an open source project, I think there's some merit to that as well. And not have to have, you know, Postgres running or in, uh, require people running Docker to even get developing on your project, which I can't really properly install Docker on my Linux because they're not packaging it for the version of Ubuntu I'm running even, which is Ubuntu is a very common Linux distribution. I'm running, Ubuntu, I'm running the latest Ubuntu, so it's not like I'm running an old version anyway. All right, so anyway, this I contain seems to work, but I'm pretty confident it's going to do the trick. Trigram, trigram similar. What? With this. Hmm. Ah, I have to have a Postgres extension. Hmm. Wow. And we are going to be using Postgres. So, but at that point, when you start adding Postgres specific extensions to your Django project, uh, and then you need to install the PG Trigram extension in Postgres as well. So, you know, trying to keep it a little bit simple and agnostic right now. That is cool. Postgres is a very powerful, that's excellent database. Excellent database. Seventy four. Here's the deployed version. So if we search for Phoebe, we're not getting any results back. And we have that bug, the memorials bug. But if I search for Phoebe, we get results back. So what I'll do is, I think I'll just deploy this with Docu. I don't know if I deploy another branch to the Docu, if it'll pick it up and make it available. But I, So I think I have to merge this into master in order to test this properly. Uh, so it's a one one character change, one line change. Rebase, delete, check out master. Fetch and sync. Fetch and pull. And then I will. to Docu Master. One moment. Hey, welcome Kali Maniac. Kali Maniac. I'm learning how to code right now using Free Code Camp, says Kali Maniac. Very cool. 
Yeah, free code camp camp is excellent. You get real world experience. What are you uh, What are you learning to code? Uh, JavaScript type programs, uh, web development, or what are you working on? fruit. Kali Maniac, are you interested in learning uh, Python and Django type of web development or what, what's your career or your, you know, goals in general, your life goals in, in particular, uh, not, not like what you want to do to land a job, but what would you like to do to fulfill your interest and curiosity? I was going to reset my database. Dang it. Yeah, Kelly says, I've got these ideas for apps. Yeah, that's cool. You got to, it's hard to, apps take a long time, a lot of focus. So you got to prioritize and uh, what seems like might just be a couple of months or even weeks. Sometimes you get it so fast uh, progress. Uh, they, they have a life of their own. And then, you know, you don't want it to just be a, a one-off thing necessarily so you'll probably be maintaining it if it's a good project for years to come all right let's see if i just reset the database what happens now that i've deployed all right so this oops this is the remote deployment let's see if i just have yup it did reset the database didn't it Yep, I'll have to test this out later then. Hmm. I think it might have something to do with having removed uh, Django Heroku. The Django Heroku using, oh yeah, the um, DJ database URL. Django Heroku had this one liner at the very bottom of my settings, my base.py settings that said load settings, you know, Django Heroku dot load settings. And that was going to change variables that were present, such as my static files, uh, path, my database configuration. Um, Docu just follows, um, pretty much it emulates Heroku. In other words, the database configuration that Heroku recommends is using that the database URL and Docu when it deploys it creates an environment variable with the uh, database URL so that database actually is still running in my Docu instance but if I reinstall DJ yeah let me think here for a second let me read the docs If I reinstall this package and put a conditional in there, if it finds a, the right environment variable. Kelly Maniac says, one of them is an app to incentivize people to walk and jog more. That sounds cool. By app, what do you mean? Like a web app or a native app, like a mobile app they'll download to the app store? What do you, what do you think and what's your target there? All right. 
right, so actually, this is uh, Daku. There's an environment variable here. So let me see if I can fix this. Um, so we don't lose persistent when I deploy into a docu because it's annoying to have to reset this data every time. Okay. Cool that we discovered that. And again, I'll have to figure static assets out at some point. Make myself a reminder issue. All right, Kali Maniac says, Kali Maniac says, downloaded through an app store on mobile. Okay, cool. <clears throat> Have you done any research on the uh, oh, mobile app development uh, languages and tools that uh, might appeal to you? What are you thinking about um, for getting it? Developed and deployed. What kind of framework and languages are you looking at? So we're going to run. Essentially, we're going to check a, if an environment variable exists. I'll do this in place. <laughs> Trying to copy and paste stuff to make my coding a little bit easier, but not so confusing. Hopefully. And then let me double check, there's this git env that you can provide a default, and I think given, I can say none, uh, Python. Yeah. The default is none there, so if it doesn't get it, then it's none. All right, so I'll leave that. Kelly Maniac says, Google Play just uses JavaScript, right? That's about all the research I did so far. Mm. Google Play Store, mm. everything runs in Java, which is different than JavaScript. Um, but you don't have to write Java. You don't have to write your app in Java or Kotlin. You can write your app in JavaScript, uh, but it then gets compiled either come sort of come trans uh, I don't really know how it works but it's something to the extent of it gets transpiled into Java or you're using a framework that like integrates that runs JavaScript in a Java environment somehow integrating with it I'd, I'd have I could show you some diagrams I don't have any first-hand experience but I've done a lot of research because I'm looking into this at some of the tools that are available and the way people are describing them um, but for example, so if you just want to write, uh, uh, do you want it to run on iOS and, and Android or just Android firstly? Because that's going to actually make a big difference in your, um, your choices and your learning path. But I can show you a couple of resources to get you a little further down the line. And I can actually make a recommendation. Particularly since you want to probably focus on um, on your app and not, hmm, well, it's hard to say, but uh, not get too frameworky. Um, if you don't need a lot of libraries, if it's a relatively simple app and you want just it to look really nice and have, you know, native look and feel and be a native app, check out Flutter. Now, Flutter is not using Java or JavaScript, it's using Dart, it's another programming language. But if you're comfortable um, 
with those types of languages like Java and JavaScript, then Dart's going to be some, somewhat familiar. And what this is going to give you out of the box is one single code base. You, def you write your app once, and it'll run on Android and iOS. But you can also use it as a, mo a desktop app. So the user can download on their home computer and you know enter their jogging diary entries there as well. Another thing you'll have to figure out is if you where the data is going to be stored. If you want people to walk and jog more, I'm assuming you're going to be storing some data like a history so they can s compare the past with the present and project it into the future, like what um, goals they have at least. So your two main options are each person stores their own data on their own device and then the data is only available on that device or you want to be able to synchronize across devices which might lead you to a decision of making a server app location that can store the um, data in a database. So that's going to be no matter what um, no matter how you design your application, if you write it in Java or JavaScript or Flutter or in Dart, uh, you'll have to figure out that fundamental architecture decision, whether the, where the data is going to live. Is it in a local SQLite database? If you look at this project here, <clears throat> excuse me, all of our data for this project is actually just on the disk right now for my development environment. And as you probably have seen early in the uh, uh, in the process of um, development here where I'm deploying it to test a feature out, then in the deployed version of the app, uh, the data is in a Postgres database. Um, so I'm developing a web application, so naturally I'm going to be using a, a database. It's very common. But you can, you can also do static web apps to a certain extent. But uh, if you have dynamic data and people saving observations or training sessions and stuff, you'll need a database. Or... Yeah, like SQLite or something like that. All right, so we got this database. So we're going to check for this database URL. And then we're going to use it. And time and access. Awesome, thanks. Yo, no problem. It's my pleasure. And in fact, there's probably... Buddy, <laughs> my English is getting a little bit messy since I've been living in Finland. There's some open source Flutter apps. If you're, I'm not a Flutter evangelist by any means. Um, I do have a friend um, who works at Google and is one of the um, project managers of, for the Flutter team. So he's recommended it to me and I've taken some time to look into it. Um, You know, I'm probably leaning more towards my personal development preferences, like web standards, so stuff like JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. But I mean, Flutter is making a really compelling case. I just wish they would have used JavaScript instead of Dart. But anyway, that was their decision. I think with Dart, Google and the Flutter team have more kind of uh, editorial control of the language. They can add features, remove features, and design the language how they want. Whereas JavaScript, there's more bureaucracy to it, although Google is very influential on that language. And I think, though, I remember seeing a, an open source Flutter app for like a workout tracker. You could probably adapt that code to tracking jogging and stuff like that. Let me just see if I can find it. Gym. Workout. Hmm. Exercise. Hmm. Well, in any case, there's also these ton of just different apps. Health and fitness, right here. Uh, there's a weight tracker. Well, heck, this might be, um, you know, kind of close. If you're just tracking something across time and maybe putting some charts there, this might be a cool one to check out the code. You can get an idea of how Flutter apps are structured, how to store data. This is probably going to have a local database. Um, yeah, and just in general, just check out all these uh, Flutter apps. Now, if you want to do JavaScript or other um, Java languages, um, you know that's a whole other path that you can take.
Let me just show you the Flutter architecture and, and particularly how it compares against like a, a JavaScript. I've seen some diagrams. So basically, Hmm. Yeah, again, I'm not trying to sound like a Flutter evangelist here, <laughs> but they've done a lot of um, outreach and evangelism for Flutter. So I'll just like point you to their evangelists. And I don't know that it's superior to React or anything like that. But if you're just wanting to learn more about how these are architected, these kind of platforms, and this is actually not even... Um, from the official Flutter team. So actually this could be a good, more, a little bit more neutral. Um, Cause they're like a take on it, a stance on it. There's all sorts of nuances that will factor in when you're considering performance in the user experience of developing a native mobile app, a cross platform native mobile app, particularly if you want it to run on iOS and Android. If you just focus on Android, then you don't really need to worry about this kind of stuff, but there's, things to consider like, is it gonna use the native UI components like the Cupertino widgets on iOS and then the material design widgets on Android? Or is it gonna define it, uh, so like use those uh, by making calls to that actual code uh, through an abstraction layer? Or is it gonna define its own sort of uh, API and sort of emulate those native widgets? So it'll kind of um, have a feel, a look and feel like a native uh, widgets, but there might be some subtle differences and particularly lagging behind when that native style change, which happens. Uh, what language are you going to be running in? Like you are going to be writing, that is, you know, Dart or JavaScript, I think are the two main sort of languages for cross-platform multiple uh, mobile apps. If you just wanted to target Android or iOS, then you have a couple more options like Swift for iOS or uh, Java and Kotlin for Android. Uh, but I think cross-platform is the way to go, to be honest. And that's why I'm really a big fan of the web platform, uh, because it is also a cross-platform, which would put me in the JavaScript camp a little bit. Uh, documentation is super important. Uh, half of my time, over half of my time here on this Wagtail project has been spent reading the docs. Uh, Kelly Maniac says, how will I be learning how to use Dart? Yeah, that's a good question. And again, I'm not saying, uh, I'm not totally trying to evangelize Dart, it's good to learn JavaScript as well. Um, and if you're having a good time at free code camp, I would continue that path as well. But, um, you know, I think there's um, the Dart language. Actually, I would start like with um, Django and Python, for example, and Wagtail. I'm more learning how to do Wagtail and kind of learning Python by osmosis uh, in a way. So you, you sort of, try to build something meaningful to you and learn the language in the process of uh, trial and error of building something that's meaningful rather than learning the level, the nuts and bolts of the language, I think is a good way to, if you look at the academic approach, they teach you the nuts and bolts of the language and maybe every once in a while have you do some sort of quasi meaningful app uh, beyond hello world and things, you know, but um, so I'd say I'm a big fan of books also, let's see. Start with Flutter and see if there's a Flutter by example. Flutter in action. Oh yeah, and this is, uh, if this is on manning.com, oh yeah. Uh, I like books because they are comprehensive usually and they're sequential in building as opposed to like random YouTube videos or random blog articles, which you'll kind of get glimpses of uh, a development workflow. Uh, granted, watch those YouTube videos, but if you got just a little bit of money, uh, invest it in yourself. And um, every book on this Manning publisher has been superb. Every one that I've got, um, that I've purchased so far, they they keep them up to date. They change, they fix the errata. Uh, they make revisions to the book well beyond the publication publication date to reflect the current state of the. Um, languages and technologies they cover. Um, 
The online reading interface is really great. If you uh, have troubles focusing on reading you know, text, they have audio versions of the book that can help reinforce the learning. Um, this was just published, so this book is brand new. I'm not in any way affiliated with Manning. I'm not getting any paid endorsement here. This is just me saying I've had a really great experience with Manning. And uh, don't tell Manning I told you this, but if you add a Manning book to your cart, I don't think they'll mind, but let's say, how do I even add this to my cart? Is it published? There's usually an add to cart button. Here it is. Oh, it's on offer right now too. Dang, I'm thinking about getting it myself. Uh, let's just say we want the ebook, 20 bucks, right? Add it to the cart and then just, let me think here for a second. You have to be signed in. You have to have a Manning account and sign in. Um, so this is like a thing, but uh, cream, <laughs> hear me out. Create a Manning account, sign in, add one to your cart, and then abandon the cart. Just like go off and you know watch some YouTube videos or whatever. Manning will send you an email with a discount code, like a 35% discount code for whatever's in your cart. You can use it right away. <laughs> so you can get this book. It's already on offer for 20 bucks, which even if you just pay that for a Manning book is well worth it. But then you can get extra 35% off if you do this little hack. Um, I don't think it's too um, too shady, honestly. I think you know they designed it to get people back to <laughs> from abandoning carts. And I think once you've read, you know, once you've gotten a Manning book, you'll be a Manning fan, to be completely honest. Uh, probably the, my favorite technical publisher. You know, I've gotten books from O'Reilly. Uh, packed publishing, no starch press, uh, and they all have their their sort of pros and cons. Like for example, Packed was a for they went through a period where they had really poor editorial uh, review, and there was just strange grammatical stuff that slipped through, bugs in the code that slipped through. Uh, in recent years, Packed has gotten a lot better. A lot of their books have source code on GitHub, for example, that really helps. Though even if there's a an error in the print version, uh, you can get the update updated book uh, source code on Git and it's open source so you can incorporate it into your own projects. That's a big plus. Uh, so I had a packed subscription and it was like 12 bucks a month for thousands of books. So that was a good value to me in case I just had to cancel that after the holidays. <laughs> I'll probably renew my subscription at some point. Um, I'm kind of <laughs> managing my budget a little bit better. But yeah. So enough about publishers. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just say, I don't want that. Manning Rocks. Pact is pretty good. I stopped buying O'Reilly books uh, several years ago when they switched to online only or the Safari only. I don't want to support that business model. Um, and No Starch Press, I've even bought, bought some of their print books. A couple of PDFs. Uh, they're good. I like their ethos and the content they have. There's this other one called Green Tea Press, which is pretty cool, by Alan Downey. All the books are free, and they're published on O'Reilly. So you can actually support Alan Downey um, by purchasing those, purchasing those. But there's some interesting stuff. If you're just interested in learning programming, and maybe you don't have you know, a book budget right now or whatever, uh, yeah, check these out. You'll learn, for example, m most of these are using Python. And you, you'll actually get like roll up your sleeves type stuff where you'll learn like how statistics works and how Python works at the same time. So you're doing meaningful work. You're learning the nuts and bolts of a language, but in the process of doing meaningful things, not just learning the nuts and bolts for, for the sake of learning the nuts and bolts. I think it's a really great way of learning. I think Alan Downey has that philosophy. And if you read the textbook manifesto, uh, students should read and understand textbooks. I think that pretty much summarizes it. And part of the understanding is by doing meaningful work. Cool beans. There's some good stuff. And there's a lot of good videos on learning Dart. Uh, so you'll, yeah, there's just a lot to uncover here. Certainly wish you the best of luck. And I haven't done any um, native mobile apps myself, so I'll be perhaps on this learning journey alongside you at some point soon. Yeah. 
Okay, let's see if I can fix this database URL. How does this work? I can just use the parse. So what we're doing here, if there is a um, database URL, which Docker creates automatically for us when I, I should have done a live session on this Docker, it was pretty cool. I did ha hit some troubles, but I was able to work them out, just reading closely to uh, paying attention to details, which can be difficult, but uh, it automatically, um, it doesn't automatically assume you're gonna use Postgres, so you actually have to run a command, you create a, a Docker app for your main you know, production code, and in this case, a Django app, and then you tell Docker to create a Postgres database for you and then link the two so that they can talk over the internal Docker network. And then you tell, or Docker then creates an environment variable inside of your app container with the URL of the Postgres, uh, you know, including the port and the username and password, all that stuff. You don't have to think about it uh, I think it did it all automatically. So we're just getting the value of that string here. And if that exists, we're just going to use it in, you know, here. And I don't know, connection max age. That's fine, I guess 600, I don't know. Is there a default for that? Or can I just leave that alone? Maybe I don't have to specify that. Hmm. Let me see if there's some actual documentation for this. You're welcome, Kelly. Thanks, and pay it forward if you have other people who uh, are along the learning journey with you. <clears throat> it's good that we can kind of just help each other along the way. I've gotten a lot of help from on my path. I still do every day in Stack Overflow and, and things, the Wagtail Core developers. So certainly I'm just trying to do my part to pay it forward. All right, so it looks like... Uh, Seems like the connection max age is optional. And, uh, I wonder if it's actually documented here. Oops. If I take a look at this parse function, no definition. Oh, yeah, so I have to import it. Add my import back. Now, if I come back down here. Check out this parse function. Sometimes if I can't find it in the docs, well, we can turn to the source code. Uh, URL engine is none, connection max age zero. Which means n not to close the connection, I suppose. I wonder if that's gonna affect anything. I'll probably go with the defaults when I don't know what it does. It's probably better to trust the defaults. So I'm not gonna open up, uh, I'm not gonna create an issue for this. I'm just gonna kind of, yeah, I'm getting pretty sloppy cowboy coding here, but I don't really have, um, this is not a production app. I'm running as I go, as I go kind of move fast and breaking things. So let's just try it out.
Looks like it's going, merged to master. And in fact, uh, what am I doing? Yep, I'm gonna just leave this open real quick. I'll come back to that, it's a low hanging fruit one. Create a pull request. Merge. Delete. I'll have to clean up my local branches. This is sort of a hot fix one. <laughs> But I'm not really being using that in the strict sense of the word. Where you have an app in public. Uh, well, I sort of have it in uh, staging server. You could, it's not production server. So I think now, change, uh, refresh my changes, and let's push to Docu Master in one moment. All right, so you can see it's building and copying my code in, running and gonna grab all the dependencies each time. It doesn't cache that for some reason. But up here, let's take a look. I think it's already created the environment variable. Where is that? Maybe I'll set the environment variable after this. We'll have to take a look where that, where that occurs. Here's the examples of the Postgres URL schema we would be using. Oh, uh, right. Oh, man. So this is cowboy code for you. This is what happens when you cowboy code. I didn't save my dependencies. So I poetry installed it and that's good. Um, um, Docu, to my knowledge, isn't really po aware of this poetry um, Python dependency manager package. This is a whole other thing. Python dependency management is a little bit messy, but there are these tools that are, um, as a baseline, Python dependency management is okay. Uh, I'll just say that first, but there are some tools that are attempting to make it okay or and like kind of smooth over some of the rough edges of um, managing a project with multiple dependencies and creating environments. And um, so that's the little bit of trouble on that front. In any case, I've got, I've been using poetry recently and uh, uses a, its own, it's not a proprietary thing. It actually uses a standardized, um, what's called PyProject, PyProject.toml. Where is my PyProject? Oh, I can actually delete this proc file now too. No, 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 Docu uses the proc file actually. That's right. So this is a standard now. Python um, enhancement proposal is created and um, uh, ratified, so to speak. So in any case, it's a YAML file that describes your Python project and the top level dependencies. Um, I don't know how to tell Docu to use this. So Docu is looking for this readme, uh, this requirements text. Let me double check, actually. Let me read this error more closely before I uh, make a fool of myself here. Uh, okay. No, it's not using a requirements text, so I was wrong. My Docker file is handling that. Uh, again, I haven't worked with this code, but in any case, we're, the basic requirement is that it installs poetry, so we're good to go there. And then after that, it actually uses the poetry to, to manage the dependencies, so I'm good. But I had to do that in Docker. Docker didn't do it by default. There's probably a, a more elegant way of doing it. So let me see this error, though. It's not picking up the dependencies, so I thought it hadn't just gone into requirements text. I forgot about this Docker file doing that part. So I've got to figure out why it's not in my poetry Pi Project Hummel. I saw. I thought I said poetry. Did I do pip install? Maybe that's what I did wrong. Poetry add. Um, I think I'm just like reading the. It says cowboy coding. I think I'm just reading the README, but actually not doing crucial steps like actually installing the dependency. Jeez. 
other stuff I work on in this project is not like this. This is a very special case where um, my deployment environment differs from my local development environment in you, that it's using Postgres instead of SQLite. All these other features I'm just able to run with SQLite with no, pretty much no problem except that at the beginning of the session we had this uh, case insensitivity issue which I'm actually doing all this to test it out. That case insens uh, insensitivity is working correctly. Just want to make sure I was up to date. I don't want my branches to get out of sync. That would be another problem. And then <laughs> what's been going on uh, in the first half of the session is really, really smooth. Could turn into r rough waters pretty quick. All right. So now we're going to just create a branch from master. Choppy waters. All right. We're good to go. Now we'll commit it to the proper branch. So I did all the configuration changes, you know, here, which was like, but I didn't actually install the, <laughs> the library locally or in my, you know, PyProject Toml. So that was silly of me. All right, now, now we get to test it out. This is everything else would normally be uh, tested locally. Hey, what's up? Don't drink and drive, bro. How you doing? Welcome to the live stream. You got any projects you're working on or what brings you by the Python live coding? Are you interested in Python and Django? All right, so I'm sorry for the fast scroll in there. Just getting myself a little bit uh, distracted. No, okay, didn't push. My ADD brain just has taken, taken the uh, a vacation. I wonder if there's a way I can just tell uh, if I can just deploy a branch with Docu and it'll pick it up and um, make that change, or if I have to deploy to master. I haven't been using Doc Docu long enough to to know that to know how it works really. I'm uh, don't drink a dive, bro. Says I'm learning Python for a project I'm working on. Cool. Is it a secret project, or can you tell us a little bit about it? Is it a web-oriented project or like a data-oriented or something you're scripting for desktop? Is it scripting or programming kind of a thing? What what do you got going on? What are you cooking up? So now we can push. Level two, welcome to the Live stream, good to see you, here to lurk. And I'm getting into Python again to be able to alter files in a tool I'm using. Okay, some file manipulation. Are they text files or are they binary files? What kind of files are they? One moment. I'm afraid of um, artificial intelligences analyzing my keystrokes and decrypt or like in figuring out my local <laughs> local password that's kind of silly of me but in any case yeah paranoia i guess is okay sometimes all righty then sometimes i forget to unmute though <laughs> don't drink drive bro i gotta think of a short name for you to call you i just call you bro no anyway not sure if web or making an app but I'm a med head who wants to gamify some cool features about medicine, such as the detective l uh, likeliness of solving a patient case to maybe inspire some curiosity in people about medicine. Well, that sounds like a noble cause. I really appreciate that. Check it out. I have an opportunity for you. Maybe, I don't know. Let me just double check real quick. Something, GNU med. 
free libre electronic medical health electronic medical records EMR system it's been around for a while it's not the most elegant interface because it's got some legacy to it but it's well established there's a few projects actually open EMR open MRS and GNU health and for some reason Wikipedia is having troubles loading isn't is anybody else having troubles with Wikipedia today I, I've tried to visit Wikipedia twice once on my phone and once on my computer now and it's not been loading I'm in Finland. I wonder if that's a Finland thing or. Hmm. Yeah, add choices. Wikipedia is having a lot of problems in the last 24 hours, it looks like. Ah. Or else they just want me to click that accept. Uh, let's see, don't drink and drive bruises. Uh oh, maybe too many people ignored the donation request for Wikipedia. That's true. Or they could be all, yes, never mind. Yeah, I'm just going to make it, I was going to make a joke that was kind of insensitive, so I don't want to actually do that. This is not super, well, it's just like, yeah, given the timing of things. Here, open EMR. Uh, so, I don't want to just call you don't, but don't drink and drive, bro. I don't know how to say your name in a short fashion. Hmm. Any case, uh, did you say you're interested in Python? Yes, I'm here learning Python for a project I'm working on. Very cool. So, der it's derive. Your name is derive or what? PHP, dang. Is there a nickname that you prefer that I could call you just for the sake of brevity in chat? EMR, EHR, electronic health records. It's a math science pun. Oh, it's a derivative, it's a fun, something for derivatives. I am not good at math or, or science, sorry. <laughs> Language Python. We have a little app that we've been doing for healthcare. Uh, it's open source. It's not written in Python though. Hospital run. Dang it. JavaScript, TypeScript even. Elastic map reduce. Uh, predict future diagnoses. Is this sort of what you're saying about? I don't know if this is relevant to you. But it sort of seems cool. They're um, probably going to use Python here. Mm, yes, pandas and numpy. Hmm, I was just hoping that there would be like this open, some open source uh, EMR or electronic medical records or a similar project that you could sort of get in. Your ideas about gamification and, and see if the, they would be ex, you know useful or kind of embraced by the the core developers and that would be a good opportunity for mentorship as well uh, it's typically uh, we have this tendency to like you know start a little isolated developments and you know it's a good way to learn of course so no no shame in the game but oftentimes there's these big projects like even the django core or something like that that could use help and use contributors uh, and who have resources and uh, network to help um, onboard new developers and help you solve challenges you encounter and stuff like that. Um, so I think that's a good way of getting um, 
you know, experience and making an impact. Particularly if that open source project is already in wide use. But in any case, I couldn't find it. So let's see. I believe in my deployment database is not mine, man. I am just. Cowboy coding is not a good idea, people. Okay. This is a silly thing. I just didn't pay attention. So I actually need to. Yeah, just to find that default dict. Be a little more careful. Seems like this. And you can see how copy and pasty I'm being. Which means that I'm not crit necessarily critically reading the text. So I'm taking shortcuts. So, yeah, don't do as I do necessarily. But what we had to do, and you see copy and pasty, almost made another copy and pasty. Error. Okay, so we have to have this dictionary. It doesn't. It's now. It didn't exist before. So right, it's not in the scope. Uh, if the database URL exists, then we're going to create uh, databases dictionary with the. They both have to have default in either case. This DJ database URL, I'm guessing, returns a a dictionary with engine and name by parsing a database URL. That's how I think it works. And here, I'm going to do something that's that's really frowned upon. But I'm going to commit directly to master and push. I'm tired of this cycle about uh, pull requests and stuff. So I just want to get this fixed. And normally I'm not, normally I'm able to follow a more rigorous workflow where I have an issue, um, create a pull request against it and review it, even if I'm only reviewing it. Um, and particularly if you're in a project where you have other developers and stuff, this, this is really sloppy coding right here, what I'm doing. But okay. Problem is, you know, the master remote master gets out of sync, and somebody could have merged something in there, and then you get all these some pretty bad stuff can happen. Okay, derive says, I guess that software can be like the engine for the game mechanic. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And they, well, yeah, I mean, they have game engines are the, are software, so yeah. Are you interested in game de development, by the way? I've been kind of teasing with the idea of doing some game dev, and I think I'm actually coming at it from a different angle recently, and I have this idea I've, co I've been cooking, but I can't really, I don't want to disclose it yet uh, for several reasons. But... In the next couple of weeks or months, or, uh, I may have an, I, a project cooking up that I'm pretty excited about. I don't want to say too much though, but uh, sort of a game, but not quite. It's inspired by games. And I was originally thinking about doing a game, like making, the, a game, making this game, but then I was like, so many people have tried making a game like this. And what if instead of building a game where you know you enrich people's lives of leisure time, you can kind of build a game that enriches the real world? Ah, oh, <laughs> another error. Cycle PG2 module. So okay, okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, this is some cowboy shnikes right here. <laughs> cowboy shnikes. Was that? So then it was Django. DJ database URL that relies on on uh, on Postgre Cycle PG two. For some reason, okay. Let me just see if I. Can. I wonder if they. I guess it makes it easier for them to parse the uh, 
database URL. So what I have to do is install PsychoPG2 binary, and then we're good to go. So I was complaining earlier that Heroku did uh, include this dependency, but I realize now it, it's uh, the DJ database URL. I think this is a good thing to have in the project, so I'm gonna continue it. I'm gonna continue committing to master. Ready? Here I go again. At least it'll be pre-compiled binary, so that's cool. Uh, it's just a little heavy. I don't want to have the, all these dependencies, but for something we may or may not be using, but in any case. Uh, am I writing unit tests for this? That's Cyber Guy Rich. Oh, gosh. Now you're going to shame me. You're publicly shaming me. You're <laughs> making me shame myself. No, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure uh, how I would unit test the kind of code I've written. Um, there's a few places that I just don't really know how, where to begin. Uh, but all I have been leaving those in all my projects, all these apps, I mean, inside of here, I've been leaving test.py uh, in there and empty as a way of reminding myself gently that I need to figure out a testing strategy mm, to have more confidence. Things are working. But the kind of code I've been writing is really so close to the way that for the most part, uh, like Wagtail works, that I would kind of be writing unit tests against Wagtail. Now, there are some places, like if I go here in this git context, um, I don't even know how I would really unit test this. I'm in a Wagtail page instance uh, overriding a method that provides page context. But other than that, whatever gets returned onto this function is just available in a Wagtail template. I don't know how to write a unit test against that, to be completely honest. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd be glad to have. I don't know if there's many wagtail books that show how to do that. All right, let's see. Derivative says, I like how they compact each patient IDs. Oh, you're talking about the article. Yeah, cool. The uh, Towards data science. Cyber Guy Rich, have you uh, any experience with unit testing in Django or wagtail apps? I know that's really a specific request. All right, so we'll commit. Cross our fingers. Committing to master. Pushing. There it goes. All right, and my little daily bob. I should be just evaluate. I should just do an eval SSH agent. No need. All right, cyber guy here, lurking mode. Have you been working on any uh, projects lately? I was curious what you've been up to. Let's see. Cyber guy says not in Django or Wagtail, although the Wagtail documentation seems to have some points of how they how to do it. Okay, let me check that out. Actually. I haven't, uh, that's not been one thing I've searched for before. I'm pretty sure the Wagtail core, yeah, testing your site, Wagtail 2.0 documentation. Let me go to the 2.7.1. Mm. Nice. Fixtures is one thing I've, I tried in the past and didn't get it to work. So yeah, what I would need to do is get a, a unit test more or less uh, relating to pages that checks, uh, that for example, creates a couple of, in this case, I have a memorials pay, index page. So I'd have to create a memorials index page instance. I have to create a couple of memorials and then check that, oh man. Uh, first, I can return some memorials in a paginated form, uh, and then somehow, I'd, yeah, I'd need to test that the uh, the filter works as expected. That's a whole adventure. I don't think I'm going to get around to it in the process of um, getting this app out the door and deployed. Yeah, the minimum viable thing. Yeah, so that is a little bit neglectful of me. But we have been working on it for like a year, and there's a, it's a big scope. The project is a really big scope. And we're migrating over from Drupal to Django. Okay, there we go. So now I got my code cleaned up, the dependencies cleaned up. 
hopefully, if I refresh this page, I suppose I could resubmit it. Hey, we're logged in now. And the old database is back. Yay! <laughs> so yeah, that was a little bit clutch. <laughs> Cowboy style. I don't recommend you try it at home, but I'm from Kansas, so I have an excuse. Let's see, the Cyber Day Rich says, program, wait, what did I, did I miss anything? No. Programming wise, no. Been doing some more notebook based projects with some SDN components. Hmm, what's SDN component? I've never heard of that single decomposition, decomposition nebula. Software defined networking. Okay, cool. All right, so we got 33 pages. It means we got some content. What was I doing? Oh, yeah, looking at this UI bug. Wasn't I? I think there's also I can make sure um, that the widgets, the widgets, that was a big digression, so I can't even remember what we were doing. I think I was going to the library and check the widgets. No, I didn't already check those widgets. No, I did already check the widgets. Ah, then we went to memorials, right? So the memorials code is up. And uh, yeah, we deployed the changes. Ah, case insensitivity. This was one I was only able to uh, reproduce the case insensitive search with the um, Postgres backend. And that's why I've had to fiddle with the Postgres, the Django, the DJ database URL, because the docu, docu automatically wires up. Okay, now there it is. All the dots are connected. So I should be able to search for Phoebe, all lowercase now. Filter Phoebe, yay. I didn't want to go to the effort of running Docker in uh, Postgres locally, so I just created myself a good hour of work to uh, live debug a sandbox environment app in the cloud. So, yeah, cowboy coding is not uh, the most relaxing uh, lifestyle. And then so Phoebe should also work if I use the capital. Yeah, so it's case insensitive. Yes, beautiful. Okay, so let's see. Don't drink and drive. I think it's pointing fun at me. Derivative is saying, you know how you're good at math when you, you know you're good at math when you can do polydimensional topology in your head. Near the point, you suck at math. Everyone in the world sucks at math. Okay, that's good to know. So I'm not alone. <laughs> okay, so cool. Tested it out. That's my uh, that's my testing strategy, cyber guy. My software testing. Thanks for pointing out the Wagtail docs. I will read more into these and try to figure out a way of uh, testing that. Context function, it might mean that I have to, uh, whoops, that's in, actually in the code, this context, get context here. I might have to just break this down. But again, some of this, to a certain extent, um, you know, I'm just basically using, <laughs> this is an excuse, but not to test. You know, I'm just kind of using basic Django stuff, all squashed into one big function, though. This is not the most bright and shining part of this project code. It's doing two things. It's filtering from context variables that are passed in via the request for this filtering and searching, and then it's paginating. I might be able to refactor the code into two parts, filter then paginate, make it more e uh, easier to read, and then I could unit test those two functions. That's probably a good approach, in fact. But then the essentially those unit tests would be writing unit tests against how the Django's internal paginator works and how Django's internal filtering works. So I'm not sure how useful that would be, to be honest. Hmm. I have to think about it. Yeah, because this whole half of it is just mainly just using the Django paginator. And this first half of it is, of course, 
getting a query string and filtering it. I've at least done my best to make the code readable. But yeah, this function is doing a lot, so I'm probably needing to clean it up. Hmm. All right, food for thought. What do I change here? Anything? Yeah. Cool. Let's close out some stuff. All right. I think we're just going to run through some, again, low hanging fruit. We've already, we're an hour and a half into it. We got a lot of people hanging out and having some cool conversations. Hey, cyber guy, were you here when we were talking about um, running, making native mobile apps? Do you have any experience with that native mobile apps? Cross-platform native mobile apps to be specific. So that worked out well. Uh, so we need to go to the memorials page. Low-hanging fruit from Master Branch. The templates, and this is the uh, Mm, I see, I see. So this is this should be go. This should be search memorials. And clear filter should be clear search. Chat is paused. Okay, cool. Cyber guy is a good resource here. They said I've done some work in React.js, so wouldn't have thought it's too far removed from React Native. That makes sense. That's one of the appeals of React Native, I suppose, that your React code is just then going to be more cross-platform. And some of the criticisms I've seen from the uh, Flutter team is that it needs a JavaScript bridge. I don't know how much of a performance penalty that pays, but I think that means native UI widgets or something maybe don't work uh, as you'd expect it or that you don't have full, I don't know really how it goes. So yeah, you haven't actually worked with um, React Native my, uh, either. So let's see. React. Um, React Native Native UI. Components. I'm not sure. Another one I've been kind of keeping an eye on is Quasar framework. Built on Vue.js. I'm really wanting to, to use the web platform. And again, I wish the Flutter team would have just built on JavaScript plain old JavaScript and not React or Vue or anything like that. In any case, I've been checking this one out. I just like the code style in Vue uh, better than React. I like being able to use just kind of HTML-ish. And I know that JSX kind of approximates HTML, but uh, everything is garbled. All the sort of declarative structural definitions are nestled and scattered within imperative code and that par imperative code can even be nestled in within your declarative code it's just like the spaghetti monster um, the coding it allows it doesn't necessarily encourage that but people just do it because they're like well everything is just javascript so they don't have to really think about discipline whereas a templating language like django here i have some basic imperative stuff i can do but my hands are kind of tied and for good reason that this should mainly be declarative structural type stuff uh, with inter you know spursed with string interpolations so just data being imputed into the 
to this, which is essentially a string, big old string of XML. Uh, so yeah, I'm comfortable with this level of uh, imperative code being mixed in the declarative, but not some of the stuff that, you know, I've glanced some JSX projects in React, and I just never gotten on board with that project in that coding style, to be honest. And I think Vue might be heading in a similar direction in any case. Uh, but I do like that with Vue, you can still have your separation of declarative, imperative, and uh, constraint-based um, layout, more or less, which is uh, essentially, are, those are also demarcated along the language boundaries of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS by design. It's not just about separating the languages, it's about separating those frames of thought, those modes of, of development. So I kind of like that aspect of view. And I also like that view can just be dropped into a regular old app, like uh, to just progressively add functionality, but it's kind of heavy. And for, I'm looking uh, at intercooler, for uh, examples of lighter ways of using technologies that have been around a bit, like Ajax, uh, but that I can still not have to buy into the whole SPA mindset, which I don't think, I don't fully agree is necessary for, for a lot of web applications. Um, but uh, so CyberGuy Rich says, JSX is great so long as you stick to standards. If the dev doesn't stick to the standards, then it becomes super difficult for any dev to understand and maintain it. Hmm, all right. So they have some, like, by standards, you mean conventions. Uh, there's some conventional ways of organizing your, the JSX code that, uh, and how easy it for, is it for new developers to find these uh, JSX conventions? Have you, uh, I mean, I guess, I just haven't looked. So this is a genuine question. Is there like an official guide or some sort of guidelines to follow? In any case, this also is another kind of way of uh, saying, so to speak, uh, that the language itself can enforce those conventions. And again, with the Django templating language, it, it doesn't really let me do things, uh, a lot of elaborate imperative code along inside of my declarativeness. It gives me a few constructs like conditionals and looping, you know, but not much else. There's like inclusion and, uh, filters and things, but these filters are, uh, you know, those are defined in code. So I don't think that's too excessive. Mm, yeah, I think it's a good balance. It's just what I'm familiar with. And I know people's familiarity varies. Uh, but I'm interested in this intercooler and a couple of other similar things that uh, they're fairly lightweight and fairly conventional. Ajax has been around for a while and uh, HTML, it's been around for a long time. It's designed to be around for a long time in the future. And it's kind of static, so that has its pluses and minuses. It evolves kind of slow, uh, but it's also predictable, like familiarity. You don't lose, you don't re, you don't lose all your working knowledge every six to 12 months. And that's an exaggeration, I know, but um, in a way it's not. And not only the knowledge, but the effort, like the code becomes obsolete faster. And that's a huge cost. This is kind of cool. You just annotate your uh, regular old HTML stuff with some API endpoints and it wires up the Ajax for you. And then uh, it'll, it'll replace the DOM with the response from the uh, endpoint. So the re endpoint returns the pre-rendered HTML snippets instead of raw JSON data. That's a little bit different than P the trend teams uh, is going towards JSON, which I think is reasonable. But uh, this one, you just, with Django, for example, I'd have to create a view that pre-renders a fragment of the page's HTML and returns that fragment. It's a few more bits and characters on the wire. Um, but this, again, this template language already behaves like that, more or less. There's functions in there. Uh, there's a render function that you pass it a template name and context data and it renders it in there and then you can return that right in the response. So yeah, I'm gonna try, I think if for dynamic projects uh, that I'm uh, working on one in particular right now, I'm gonna give this intercooler a try. Cause I don't wanna do a full SPA. I don't think any of the things I'm working on right now are 
SPA worthy. Cool beans. All right, so I think I just nailed these three. I got that one, that one, and did I get the clear search? Yeah. Okay, okay. Issue 175 here. So this is a little more conventional workflow. Again, cyber guy thinks pointing out, not doing any testing, but this necessarily doesn't need any testing. This is just template text. It's kind of my comfort zone right here. It's mostly just uh, relying on a framework to work as it is advertised and not getting too far out and uh, you know, custom app territory. We have another project we're working on um, and probably gonna be porting over to Django. That is a fully uh, fledged uh, application for data health, actually uh, well-being data tracking and encouraging healthcare providers or well-being uh, coordinators to engage with their um, their, their clients who are essentially elderly people living in assisted living communities. Uh, so tracking the, um, the well-being of the whole resident population at a glance and seeing who you know, might want to go out for a walk today or who might want to maybe listen to some music or do a group activity, stuff like that. We actually are kind of interested in gamifying that, um, although the, just the data visualization has been proving pretty effective at uh, when you raise awareness, then people, I think, can act and they can make informed decisions about, you know, who to coordinate these events with, which residents haven't been very active lately. So that's pretty effective already, but it would be interesting to have some game-like elements in that project. All right, so conversation. I think we're good to go. Rebase and merge. Delete branch. It's fully open source as well. I haven't been live coding on it for uh, over a year, really. Uh, so maybe I could get back into that project, particularly if we do the Django port. I wrote, we wrote the thing in, uh, the, it's called Jerry Life. We wrote it in uh, JavaScript and Meteor.js and the community around the Meteor.js project. Um, originally it started as a way for developers to uh, be really productive and get minimum viable prototypes out the door as well as productionize them. Frankly, um, I think it works really good for production apps as well. Then the whole scalability uh, crew came along and says, does it scale? That was the, the daily question you'd get. Does it scale? And it's maybe the wrong question to ask, particularly for new projects. It's like not, it does your idea scale, will your community scale? I think most projects don't need Facebook scale solutions at all. And a lot of times the scalability issues aren't necessarily at the like JavaScript framework level. They're probably going to be in your database. Like that's going to be one of the most significant bottlenecks. Um, but in any case, that mentality ruled the day and sort of they re whole, it shifted the whole media project into, um, I don't even know how to describe it. it. Just changed the ethos of the project though. And then now that whole community has kind of evaporated as well. So, a little bit embittered by that. But I think, I don't sense that kind of thing happening with Django. And I think Django does scale pretty good if you needed to. And again, it's the database that's gonna be, I think, a significant hitch in this project we're developing here with Western Friend. Um, you know, we're not gonna have millions of users. It's not that size of an organization. Cool. Let's see if we can find some more low-hanging fruit issues. I'm getting towards the end of my wick for today's work, probably.
but there are a few low hanging fruit stuff that I can do. So <laughs> I lost a lot of my viewers there in that last uh, die track. Well, three out of, I lost uh, three out of seven. <laughs> so our deep archive issue. We'll do that. I'm going to do one pull request with multiple issues here. Seems to be. Uh, yeah, it's a different. Create a, let's create a new branch. It's a different commit. I don't see it here on the the Git graph. Though. That's kind of strange. Why don't I see it here? Hmm. Here it is. So just one behind master. All right. Good thing I checked that. I could have done pulling from Origin Master. The same result. All right, so now we're going to check out the Deep Archive issue model. So that's under our magazine. Models.py. We're going to go down to Deep Archive issue. Or I think we just call it Archive issue. And let's make this. Null equals true and blank equals true. Okay, we got that. So let me just push this up there and I'll open a pull request and I'll tag the issue with that. So we'll be able to close them all with one fell swoop. And I think I might have a second wind and try this um, faceted searching. So give it, a, give it a shot. What was that? 180. All right, we'll create the pull request and track a couple of issues against it. So we have 180. And the deep archive issue table of contents author optional. Now this will be one that we need to make the field optional as well as have a, an alternative text. If there's no option, if there's no author, it should at least display something in the user interface like anonymous or something like that. Cool. So we've got a deep archive issue. So here's an archive issue. We have an archive issue Article. Oh, okay, yeah, that's right. Where this? That's right. Stream field of archive article blocks. So let's find where this was defined. Here we are. All right. So this authors block, a list block, a list block of page choosers. I think you just, this is a guess, but uh, so how do I make a list block optional?
Oh, okay, that this makes sense because uh, the whole struct. Hmm. Dang. We do want the archive article to have a title. It's got to have a title, but uh, optionals are uh, authors are optional. Dang. <laughs> A little snafu here going on. Let me just try. <laughs> this is going to throw an error, right? Maybe it's not. It just uses things if it's just consistent. So what we have, uh, we go to uh, damn, how do I... magazine, deep archive. It just worked. Really? I'm just pretty glad then when stuff like that happens. Let me just double check. Uh, that allowed it to, hmm, maybe it was optional anyway. Why do we have this issue here? It might have been the old implementation. It seems to work without this null is true, blank is true. It's allowing me to put zero more authors on there, which is exactly what we want. Very cool. In that case, then this task is just to reset the template, reset the code, discarding these changes, actually edit the template so it has a message there when there's an anonymous I wonder if this is, again, relating to deploying it. Probably not, but uh, it could be something I could try real quick. In the production, or uh, sort of the staging deployment. Wagtail admin, if we go to pages. One thing I can improve here is having now a magazine section with issues and deep archive issues, so I, I can jump more quickly to the deep archive. But if I edit this and I delete the author, yeah, I think that issue must have stemmed from the way I originally implemented this issue, which had major shortcomings. And this is a great improvement. So I just need to submit a text for anonymous articles. Good. One uh, thing I just noticed though, is the, um, when you're creating a deep archive issue, it's allowing for child issues and I don't believe we should need those. So let me just, let me just lock that down real quick. Archive issues, so if I just put uh, better parent page type, How do I do this? How did this code getting my yeah, that's just an example of sloppiness and not keeping things organized. My you'd field definitions go up here. Oh, how did I do this? The home page model sub page type. I guess sub page types equals an empty ar array so that you can't really add a child of a deep archive issue. Mm. Double check that again. Ah, uh, this is an archive issue, which is, yeah, that's what we're looking at actually.
I wonder if I have to mic that, migrate that end in. Oh, come on. Yes. Oh, damn. I didn't make sure my migrations. Yeah, so friends, uh, pulled in 1929 is definitely a, an archive issue. Oh, you know why? Oh, man, sleepiness is kicking in. There we go. I was on the remote server. Deep archive. Maybe I don't want to risk too much going into that. Uh, here we go. So I just look at this one. I, uh, yeah, I can't make it, can't add a child page there. And then uh, volume is optional. Good, good stuff. I think if I had a magazine sidebar and add two links, on, uh, two child links, uh, magazine issues and then archive issues, that would be a nice convenience. So let me just uh, go ahead and add this. Bonus task. What we'll look for is an existing wagtail hooks. And particularly, let's look for the resources hook. So I have some copy and pasting code. To prime my memory, I'll just be very careful, you know, to read that copy and paste code. Resources is the library. Oh, right, right. Community. Good. All right. Yeah, so it's essentially just a, what it is, a, two model admins, and those model admins refer to the particular model that has the data that will be displayed in a table or paginated list, and then a top-level model admin group groups them together and creates a, like a, drawer menu, a pop out, flat menu. So yeah, we'll grab all these imports and stuff like that. And we are working in the magazine. Wagtail hooks, I do have magazine department model admin, interesting. So that's here, uh, where is uh, Magazine departments, here we are. So I'll put it all together underneath the magazine departments. Let me just, Paste everything in below that. I need to take a quick break, two hours and seven minutes in. Thanks for the remaining viewers. After my little uh, 
diatribe against uh, scalability mentality. But I'm facing that a lot in my work and all this kind of stuff. I, I see this, it's a very pervasive mentality. So yeah, and I do harbor a little frustration about that. I know it's kind of hard to, a little bit of cognitive dissonance to when you sort of speak contrarily to that paradigm. All right, so we will continue in just a moment adding a resource, model admin group for all of the magazine related model models. So magazine issue, um, archive issue, and magazine departments will all be under one flyout menu. It'll be pretty cool. Thanks again. I'll be right back. All right, thanks for bearing with me. And I'm back, so let's go ahead and refactor this. I'm just gonna go into code focus mode. And what we need instead of, we need to add these to a resources group. So let's add this uh, magazine resources group, or magazine group. And the model admin group takes three, like one or more model admins, groups them together in a common menu creates a fly out. Cool thing about Django is, um, and Wagtail that is, all the templating and URL routing and things like that are handled internally. You just declaratively define how things should be organized. Um, so we're gonna use a font awesome icon from font awesome for something that looks like a magazine. Could be FA book, that looks decent. Just go with FA book for right now. Man, come on. Dude, this is not cool. All right, hold on a second though. So from models import, magazine department. So we gotta get our models in there. I'm gonna have some errors down here. Just gonna stop the server running. Magazine department, magazine. And magazine issue and archive issue.
All right, so we've got three model item in. To find, just put these in the. Just need um, some font awesome icons, but I believe at this point um, should be working. We've got magazine issues, archive issues, and department issues. Uh, magazine issues have been created, archive issues. Got a couple of those, and departments should work now. As All right, so let's just add a little bit of fine tuning there to the, the aesthetics. Issues, departments. Really, they can just use the same icon, I believe. Think about there's a couple of uh, other metadata we can add for wagtail model admins. If we look in the definition here, I can add um, a list filter, which gives us a nice widget. Nice. We can add JavaScript to make it more. Interactive, change the styling. All right, let's go ahead and uh, for magazine issues, let's also use a list filter. Whoa, and it goes filter equals it's a tuple, it'll be a one item tuple, I believe. See if this works. Now, if I go to issues here, uh, published. This is an internal field. I think Wagtail creates it as part of the page model. Let me double check. In the page model, should be a. It's got to be a stream. To identify the field name. Now, if I, I haven't had any archive issues, but uh, let's try this with the archive issues because I do have one. It's not going to be very useful for the <laughs> deep archive because these are going back to like decades, almost a century. All right. Might be useful for the magazine. All right, we'll take that back off. Let me see if there's just a little bit of a, this is really small. 
but just some kind of like a leaflet or paper. Mm. Let's go to newspaper O. Yeah, I just realized this should this whole group should appear right up top. All right, that's a little bit better. I'll I'll call it good for now. And we can Oh yeah, they're both two. Let's see, two thousand eight. Yeah, and we can do a little bit of date faceting. Let's see how that works out. I don't know if there's any other fields I want to add necessarily. Oh, okay. To a field first published at. Hey, what's up, level two? Ellipses, how are you doing? Still lurking? Apparently. How's your project going? It's up here. Issues. I haven't created one. I'm gonna do this out of order, just so I have a way of testing. Issue two has to have an image. Dang it. And then issue one. I'm publishing them out of order with the same. Mm. That makes it clear now. So actually, the publication dates the field we want. Here we go. Good improvement. All right, let's do something challenging now. Facets. Could be a lot of moving parts here. But essentially, what we want to do is first just get all the years that um, a Deep Archive issue was published. There's one or more. Then, as a bonus, we'll get a faceted count of those. So, first, let me see if Wagtail facets. Will will do the trick for us. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Oh, okay. So there's two things I gotta do. So first I gotta search for all the deep archive objects, just all of them. Facet them by the publication date, which I'm pretty sure I've been uh, consistently using that field. Let me just double check that. Because it matters here as well. Right there looks good. Down there. Mm, publication date must be. We actually defined the publication date for magazine issue. Ah, so I'm not being consistent there. Magazine. Archive issues if I, ah, okay. Yeah, because it doesn't have that same field, does it? So I can't use that. First published at. Well, I should be consistent. Publication date. So I'm using an internal uh, field. I think this is a, this is a good approach. And I'm, I'm tempted then to to remove the publication date field. From the magazine issue for consistency. Although the problem being I wouldn't be able to uh, define help text on an internal field. So then there's that. No, oh, I can. We're good there. Hmm. I think there's two uses of these fields. The first published at field is for Wagtail internally to keep track of when the actual content was published. And then the publication date field is for Western Friend editor to determine when the magazine issue was published. So actually maybe I will add the publication date field to the archive issue. Let Wagtail manage its own internal metadata. Yeah. and then use the publication date field here instead. And in fact, yeah, yes. Hooks, I can then order by publication dates. Oh, it's optional. Hmm. All right, I did that for convenience. Well, I can still order by it.
All right. So now January 1929 in April. Well, these are just example, I think. Because null, I guess, is sorted before. Let's just do that. Publish. And let's go ahead and add that to the table view, the publication date. So it's here with the title. Since it's using it to sort, oops, wrong button. Wrong one. <laughs> there we go. Mm -hmm. Let's see that at a glance. All right, so now for the faceting, faceting, we have the proper field. I'll simply I'll facet on the content type ID. The thing is, I won't facet on the content type ID. I'll facet on the field, uh, which is a date field. And I want to facet on a date component, the year component. So this is a little trickier. It's a wild guess, which isn't always a good way to approach things, but I think I might be able to use a dunder year. If I facet on that, Let's try it out. So this code I can probably run in the Python shell. Let's give it a try here. So good, we're in our poetry environment. And what we want to do is import our model. Oh, wait, from import deep archive. Import archive issue. All right. So we've got two objects. Cool. So that'll work. This dunder year is going to work. What we're going to do. So we've got a object um, query set there. What if we facet by publication date? Year. We can't use that object. So what are we using here? We're using uh, objects search. Okay. Dot. 
well, a query really is an empty string. Oh, and then, yeah, so here's another thing. SQLite doesn't support faceting, which is, which makes sense. So the trick becomes, do I do this? If I wanted to do the wagtail way of uh, supporting faceting, I need to run Postgres locally, which is something I won't be able to do right now. I'm at two and a half hours. I have to put this off for another day. Now what this is gonna to return to, uh, for me is uh, ID and count. So I actually don't think this is gonna be uh, useful. Maybe it would. Uh, this would in turn be actually exactly what I want. I think the year and the count instead of content type ideas of integer field more or less. I can see how that's behaving. Hmm. But there might be a way to do it a little lower than Django, other than Wagtail in the Django layer. This would be good, though. Um, so all I really need is a list of unique years. That's the first thing to note. I don't necessarily need the counts, so for maybe the minimum viable thing is just to get the list of years. Let's try that. So then if I test this out, That gives me the year, a list of the years. Uh, actually, that gives me the list of the publication dates, which happen to be distinct. But for example, if I were to add February 1st, 1929. Well, just let's reuse a proper identifier. Publish. Oh, and that's a unique constraint. Okay, so now we've got just the values. Now we have 1930, 1929, 1929. But values distinct. We just have, hmm. 1930, 1929, 1929. Oh, whoa. Because the publication dates are distinct. Hmm. I think is what's happening here. The, we have three distinct publication dates in this year modifier. It's not being evaluated in the distinct. Hmm. All right.
So that's the imperative approach, makes sense. Hmm, elegant, that's what I'm looking for. So we got archive issue, date object for, and then we want year for the field publication date. Yes, that works. Oh man, that's really cool. <laughs> that's stuff like this is what happens when you let your framework get mature, like when you let it develop and you don't abandon it, and uh, you just and people stick around it. That's really cool. Yeah, this definitely should be the top answer. Ah, uh, well, that's fine. Uh, it returns a list of date, time, date, objects. That's true. Oof, that's a little bit heavy. So yeah, then I can uh, use probably, a, let's see. So now I can iterate over these, I think, right? Hmm, no? This is weird, it's a page query set. Let's go ahead and grab those. Um, publication years. Let's see what happens with that. So. in a minute. There we go. So just use a list comprehension to take those daytime objects and grab the year component. Okay, so a couple lines. I think this is this is tractable. And this is not too bad. Uh, it's not going to give me the count of, uh, it's not going to give me the actual faceting I was hoping for, but that's actually not a requirement. The minimum viable thing is to let people filter by year, and later maybe we can add fa uh, the faceting count as an enhancement, uh, which if I just set a local Postgres environment up, like I should be doing uh, anyway, you know, then I could have used that faceting approach. Cool beans. Let's go ahead and grab these. So what did I do? Publication year should be publication dates, but anyway, okay. Where are we going to use this also is the question. So on the, this one's done, 181. Let me see this pull request real quick. So the deep archive template, we need to check out the page context real quick. Some magazine models, archive issue, deep archive index. So I've got this context, which is getting kind of heavy. It's going to be following the same pattern, though. It's a filter, then paginate, um, which I could break it into two sub functions.
I'm not sure where I would actually, uh, if I do refactor like that, I guess those would be class members. Well, let's try it out. All right, so now we'll have a new context variable for publication years. So let's get that into the template. It is in the template. I mean, let's uh, use it. So essentially, the archive hmm. ah must have typed it wrong i think it'll go along the sidebar so we have a two column layout now or it could go at the top to be honest Let's just put it at the top real quick. Still looks really bad. What the hell, dude? We should be in a container already. I mean, I wrapped the whole parent context in a container. No, that didn't help.
Maybe too bad. Doesn't need to be so much. You think we're reusing? Hey, what's up, that cyber guy, Rich? Welcome back. If you left, what makes you choose VS Code over something like IntelliJ? Hey, that's a good question, actually. Um, I I was using PyCharm for a while, so I think that's uh, underneath. I think it's the same IDE underneath, more or less. Py PyCharm, yeah. It was really good, and actually, that was my first taste of a real uh, IDE, like an integrated, you know, fully integrated development environment where I have like. A, Terminal inbuilt there. I've got IntelliSense where it's inspecting the code and I can go to definition and things like that. And I'm still not even using just, just the tip of the iceberg here as I learn. Um, so, and I bought a license for um, PyCharm even. And I was really enjoying it. Particularly, I wanted that because I'm working with Django. So yeah, I, I agree, that's a good IDE. I had some problems See, like, might be I reinstalled my OS or something. I mo was moving around and I reinstalled PyCharm, and or just some, one day the license stopped working. I don't remember exactly now. It's been over, over a year to be honest. And I was like, well, okay, that's a bummer. I do like an ID, and prior to that, I'd been using um, Atom, like more or less a text editor. If you get enough plugins and, and extensions in there, you kind of start getting IDE-like experience. Maybe it's um, improved since I last used it, like two years ago or so. Um, but I was like, well, let me put down my skepticism over Microsoft's motives here and just try out VS Code. And I did try it, and out of the box, it was pretty close to what I was getting, uh, the experience I was seeing with um, with PyCharm. I had to install the Python plugin with you know one click, basically. Yeah, PyCharm is good. I like it. So um, I just don't want to. I mean. I don't mind buying software. I do buy software sometimes, but I try to use things that is open source as much as I can. I pay licenses. I, I make donations to open source projects. Uh, I've got recurring donations to a couple of open source projects that I enjoy using. Um, so it's not out of cheapness. I did originally start using open source. I originally found out free software and open source software because I couldn't afford licensing. I couldn't afford software and I was pirating everything. That was like oh, 15 years ago almost, 10 or uh, over 10 years at least. When I was sort of kind of seeing this word, this phrase free software, open source, and sort of starting to get an idea of it. I've come much more uh, to embrace that philosophy. Uh, and PyCharm has a community edition, which is good. Again, I was getting the license because I needed Django integration. I was enjoying that. And I, I think PyCharm still has some nice features. Um, for Django that maybe aren't quite so um, polished in, Py in uh, VS Code, like the debugging. I haven't really ever gotten debugging to really work. Uh, every time I've tried it, I've come away with some weird error and I just didn't want to keep fighting it. Although I would really like a proper debugging ex experience here. But yeah, is that what you use, CyberGuide? You use uh, PyCharm? Or you said you're doing more tap, uh, note, uh, notebook oriented stuff. Are you, well, another thing, VS Code actually, and maybe PyCharm, you know, they, you can write notebooks, notebook code, IPy, note, NB files, you can edit them right in the IDE. So they're actually kind of good for that as well. I, I just turned to Jupyter Lab for that. And it's actually, Jupyter Lab is kind of getting um, sort of more and more like an IDE every time I've, look at it it's even got built-in git integration if our as far as i recall but what are you using cyber guy all right so my select looks really bad i think i'm just missing classes for this so let's see. just need the default form classes in the mm, well let me just essentially copy the uh Part of the uh, what do we have? The library. What was I working on earlier? Damn, I'm just getting tired. Search memorials. Templates. Let me get it's just some copy paste code. This really helps if I can copy and paste myself and clean it up a little bit. So I don't need the whole thing. I will need a form because we're going to want to post this data. 
or I think it's just get should work. Get request should work here. And we don't need a whole filter and collapse and stuff like that. Yet, uh, Yeti Muse, one, two, three. Should that be a label instead of a P? Yes, it should be Yeti Muse. Thank you very much for helping out, clarifying that. And here, uh, I've already struggled through this. So more or less, yes. We will want. Ah, my brain is so slow. Publication yes. So behind this, uh, in my HTML, I'm using basically Django query expressions to a certain extent. This is, as you saw earlier in the code, in the Python code, this is how Django gets the public a year component of a publication date in this case. thing because I'm uh, on the previous one I was allowing that to be showing it oh gosh it looks bad but it works <laughs> nice okay cyber guy rich yeti muse one two three if you got any suggestions here on how I can make this not so ugly let me know what I'm doing wrong here so I don't need this clear search Are these colliding what's going on why is this going up against the edge so I need a card body probably and then the form it's like dividus and so I forgot let me get to you let me read what you're writing all right well, that's a little bit better and I still got all this Ugliness and still these are bumping up against each other. So Cyber Guy Rich says, when I write something in Python, I will use PyCharm, mainly because I still have a free license for it from being a student. At work, we use VS Code, which isn't bad at all. Just think Python is still has a slight lead, in my opinion. Yeah, I kind of agree. I think PyCharm was, is really nice. So, yeah. And I think, actually, they uh, who, who makes IntelliJ? Is IntelliJ the name of the company, or is it... Um, is that their Java ID? I can't remember, but anyway, I think they even support, uh, like they've been having, uh, they support the Python Software Foundation, for example, with JetBrains, yeah, I think. Yeah, so I think they're doing really great work, and uh, I think everybody, you know, teach their own, I'm not harshing on, uh, you know, proprietary software, proprietary IDs in any way. I think uh, there's room for these different worldviews. I think my main journey has been trying to be as close to open source uh, ethos as possible lately. I've been having pretty good success, and so VS Code has uh, been a good experience. All right, so what's going on here? This look, everything up here looks nice and fine. If I could do a form inline, that could actually help. Filter form. Probably don't need that. The form, hmm, I can't remember where the metadata gets its name from. The, uh, in the request. Class equals. Let's try that. Form in line at least. So we can slim it up a little bit. <clears throat> Damn. 
Okay, maybe I'm not getting enough columns. Let's do six columns firstly, just to see how that works. Jet brains. Okay, so that forming line is working. What did I do down here that is making these float around like this? It's just each of them is creating a column. I'm doing something unorthodox, I think, right here. I should really be. So I'm not assuming any rows. I'm not creating a row when there's some division occurring. I'm kind of hoping for, so this is probably my problem here. Um, not necessarily a masonry grid. Well, maybe I want this. What I really want is a masonry grid. Maybe that would actually solve this issue. Cool. What do you think? Masonry? Should I look up a, a masonry library? Or is there a way to solve this more elegantly with just bootstrap semantics? Now, when we started this project, I was taking the opportunity to check out CSS frameworks, right? And just to say, hey, bootstrap is good. It's been around for a while. And I like, and I hope one of the main motivations here is to build on mature technologies that have been around for a while, that they've still got a solid community. There's a lot of bells included. And, um, but I did take a look at uh, another CSS framework that is popular and not um, for React called Bulma. <laughs> I thought it would come up at the top. And Bulma has a dang grid. In any case, I'm not using Bulma mainly because it's a one person, one developer show, and uh, there's been some drive-by commits, but I, it just doesn't it doesn't have the sort of uh, I don't want to go into this whole one, uh, but uh, it just doesn't have the community and cohesion of of Bootstrap. I mean, Bootstrap four had just come out, I still like that too. Cyber Guy Rich says, in Python, is Python your only language, or are you proficient in others? Um, I've been working with JavaScript for. Well, almost five years. Um, so, yeah, I'm pretty proficient in JavaScript. I prefer Python, hands down, though. Yeti Muse says, I like materialized CSS, like Google UI. All right. That's what we're after. We're after a material design CSS framework here. Yeah, I mean... I kind of chose Bootstrap out of familiarity. And I wanted some ready-made components. And I wanted a framework that's been around and has a community who are contributing code. So let's actually check that out first thing. Let me check the components. So is there a grid component, you know, Yeti, off the top of your head? Not just a grid, like a CSS grid, but like a, a masonry grid where I don't have to, uh, I can define like the column width and it'll just lay it out for me. And uh, we, we have a pagination on this grid, so it'll never be over nine. You know, some, I can make it so it's some di you know, division. So it's divisible, uh, or there's a common denominator here. What are we, I think we have a nine or 12, actually, probably 12 items. I don't, I'll have to look at the code, but I can make the arithmetic happen. And we're just using stuff like cards. We're not really using a lot of advanced stuff, but I'll have to change the uh, semantics, it looks like, for the whole project but that's not too bad, I can deal. This does look good. Materialized CSS grid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So if I added one more div here, this is, let me do it. Will it wrap? To a new row, or do I have to define a new row? Looks like I have to define a new row, and that's the problem I was trying to avoid. With masonry, you just kind of put them in there, and it, it'll wrap and it'll do the layout for you. Is there that type of a thing? And let me show you again. The uh, let me hop back over to Bowman to show you what I mean, because it does have this component. 
But again, I didn't go with Bulma because there's not the uh, um, community or sort of scale around it. I think it's under layout, actually. Man, tiles. Here it is. This is a specific um, component. I think it's unique in what I'm after, really. You just say, this is a tile, and you put as many tiles on the screen as you have. And it just handles it for you, makes them fit snugly. It's also been called masonry. And you can nest them, you can nest tiles. Because I don't want to do arithmetic, and, uh, so I don't want to say for issue and issue, if you know this is the third issue, then create a row. I don't want to write that kind of a loop. I just want to loop over them and create a common pattern. Um, you know, tell it how big of a, how many, how wide it should be, but let the, CSS engine handle the layout. Hmm. I will look at materialize though. This might be a good direction for us. Because I'm using bootstrap and then a bootstrap material library. I can't remember. Oh, and they have horizontal cards. Oh, Yeti Muse, thank you. This is cool. I was fighting with this in bootstrap. It didn't really come out that great at the end of the day. Huh, right there. So cool. It's trade-offs, I'm sure it's got some shortcomings. Which one of the things I'm curious about is the sort of viability of the project. Where's the GitHub? Forms, it got good form stuff. Ooh, does it have... Uh, Pickers, select. Ooh, ooh, look at that. That's really nice. Does it let you just pick a year? That, because I have actually a use case for that. Well, actually what we're working on right now. Oh, man. No, that's not it. Cool. It looks like there's a lot to dig into here. Let's check some vital signs. Oh, <laughs> that happens. Let's see. You know, you could say it's a mature project. It doesn't need much stewardship or maintenance. But... I think that's a bad sign, to be honest. 1,000 contributors, but let's just look at the last year. Yeah, it's just got a steady state of stuff going on. And how many committers with over 10 commits, let's say? Well, six people. And there's one person here with over 10 commits. And, you know, commit count doesn't mean a whole lot. Right, there could be one commit that changes 20,000 lines of code, right? So, but am I in the right repo? Also, this is you know run by an organization, so that means they've got their stuff together a little bit. This is run by an organization, too. Okay, no, no, just a guy uh, or a person. So and they're not very active, I don't know. So I'll take uh, materialize into consideration, but yeah, these kind of factors are, are really important to me after being pretty bur burnt by um, the Meteor.js uh, experience. Had a lot of promise. It's really, I think innovative in some ways, but I got a little bit uh, swept up in the main reason I turned up to it is because turned in, uh, onto it or started using it was uh, because it promoted simplicity and uh, productivity and developer experience. But I think then the razzle dazzle went away, and so did the community to a certain extent. I guess the, there's still a few, about as many contributors as Bootstrap that have done ten or more commits in the last year. 
And Benjamin's been burning, like, kicking out the code, so that's cool. Ben Newman. Yeah, look at that. Contribution, contribution graph, a lot of activity. But you need, like a framework needs contributors. And let's look at Django, because I know it's not perfect either. But uh, a lot of people have come by, most of them probably just to say hi. Pretty steady state, 2019. Well, we've got, you know, number of people with over 10 commits. Again, I know that doesn't mean a lot. Like here's 13 commits with 1200 lines. Yeah, it's hit or miss. But this just to me, when you see like these, it's a lot of people that are taking care of the thing and keeping it up. And maybe I could also turn into one of those people also instead of just kind of sitting back in armchair. What do they call the armchair coaching or whatever? Saying this project should do more for the people. But in any case, so yeah, th I'm trying to just factor this in pretty big time in my technology decisions right now. And just for third, for completeness, let's look at Bulma. Has a lot of promise, a lot of, uh, it sounds really interesting, mm, but it's pretty much just a one commit, one person show really. And, uh, Yeah, it's the main, the core developer. So uh, I just don't, I don't want to bite. So now we're back to the same question. What can I do with Bootstrap to fix this jankiness? Where did it go? Hmm. My inline form is working. What did I call it again, masonry? Now, does this mean I have to install masonry? How active is masonry? And do I want another huge dependency just for one layout? Oops, that's not actually what I wanted to click. And then I also have to take into mind to account that um, the number of contributors would be proportional to the usefulness, the utility and broadness scope of the project. But there's not even, there's no activity in the last year. So yeah, that's not gonna work. I'm gonna have to rethink this layout now. Or, because I mean, the layout's pretty much working if I just, for example, take this row off, comment it out real quick, and refresh it. Like, I, I can't tell anything's wrong with it here. So if I can just sneak my little date selector in here, I'm cool. Uh, but as soon as I add another row, well, that didn't work very good. I do want to, no, actually, what if I do in the row? I'll do a full width column. So in other words, okay, you, instead of column, or six column, come on. Jeez. What if I do it? <laughs> this is probably really kludgy, but I'll be in the same row so I can rely on the padding and stuff. One, two, three, one, two, Mr. Div. Yeah, I sneak it in there. It's gonna be kludgy, but uh, 
And then I make it a full width. Ah, still colliding. All right. I can deal. This is Kluge, so pardon me. Five, let's do six. Yeah. Cyber game rich. You thought about using live reload when developing, like browser auto refresh when you're changing a file through Cyber? Yeah, that would be cool. Um, I think even the debugger, if I could get debugging to work <laughs> in VS Code, might do that. That's a good suggestion, seriously, because I do hit that Control R a lot. So let's see. Django live reload. Well, there's a live reload functionality integrated with your Django development environment. I pip install it, add it to the apps, add it to the middleware. Looks good. Not well maintained though. You can see 2018. Mm -hmm. But they're recommending it here in 2016. Granted, uh, this live reload might not need uh, constant diligence, but they're using live reload.js. I think it's it. Also, that's under active development. Well, Rich, I could try it out. Or this is something else, isn't it? I to turn into a commercial project or something. Now, also, um, I do have this uh, plugin on VS Code that uh, sort of does a similar thing, but for static files. I don't know if that'll actually be useful here. Oh, what is it? Go live. By the way, one thing I think is pretty awesome about VS Code that uh, I don't think PyCharm has is a live collaborative uh, pair programming online. My friend uh, John and I have been using it. Have you checked this out, Cyber Guy or Yodi Muse? Have you have you seen this uh, live share? This is crazy. It works. It works really good. And um, basically, you start a live share session, and or you have a live share spaces. So for people who are hanging out online, it's called VS Live Share. So they have a bunch of people here. Uh, you can see who's online and start live. You can invite them to a live share session. So then they actually, when you invite somebody to a live share session, then it starts a sh session here. And um, 
that session, there's a few plugins for it, uh, includes a shared terminal so they can see, not only can they see like the code editor you're on and edit it with you if you allow, if you make it so it's not read only, otherwise they can't edit it. Um, they can make changes. I think they can save those changes. So you're in the same buffer, but they can see the tabs you're open and they follow you. So if I open a different file, they, they, the person will come along with me if they're following me. They can see the terminal that's running. Then they can access the app via like localhost port, whatever. Like it's running on their own local computer. It's crazy. In addition, it has um, audio chat. So you can uh, write in VS Code. You can just talk with each other. It's got a whiteboard, like a, a plugin for collaborative whiteboarding. In real time, you can see what each other's drawing. It is really cool. I'd like to, uh, I'm going to start working, um, incorporating that into this live stream, particularly with people who are like hanging around a lot and wanting to get more involved in actually the code aspect of it. They could be, I don't want this live stream necessarily to be just about me, uh, but here I'm trying to be productive and focused. So, you know, those live coding sessions are very much more social and harder to focus and just, um, even with chat here, I get off topic a lot, but uh, yeah. This it, live code is very cool. And the cyber guy, if you want to try it out sometime uh, when you're in one of the sessions with me, I don't want to set it up right now because I'm already at like three hours, three and a half hours. So I kind of want to wrap this up and get this layout working, but we, we can definitely try it out. It's worth it. And yeah, if you're comfortable, you may have to do audio if you don't want, but uh, yeah, it takes a couple of steps to set it up. So let me know next time you're in chat uh, if you've got you know the VS Code and Live Code um, extension installed, uh, and then I'll just start a Live Code session. You can I'll send you the link. I'll whisper it to you, and you can join up. We don't have to do audio chat if you don't, if you're not comfortable with that. All right. So let's see how. Get to a good stopping point at least. I think I'm really in the home stretch though. In this I'm fighting with the UI type thing, I can do that a little bit later. What I want to really do is get this wired up. So now it looks good enough, right? And I might make it collapsible like the um, the memorials page, so it's not always hanging out up there. We'll see. Yeah, I'll figure that out. Uh, I have a basic working thing. Maybe I'll put in a little bit of text and set it, or set it filter by you. So it's a little cleaner. I submit the form, we'll get a get request to the server. Now, let's go back to the code. Let me, let me commit this real quick, because this is good progress. What do we do over here? Mm -hmm. So add publication years to the, uh, and I'm getting to the cyber guy, I don't know if you were here when I wrote this, I'm getting to the point where sort of taking your advice and making my code at least more testable, if not readable, by factoring those, uh, this get context function into smaller functions. Um, that might, I might be able to unit test or at least have a fair amount of confidence when debugging, I can locate problems and fix them and understand the, um, understand the issue at a glance almost. So yeah, following that pattern here, I'll try to keep this in mind in the future. So I added another bit of context. So yeah. That's all I did here. Publication year filter form. Now we're going to come back into the context and I don't think this will justify its own sort of function here. Because what we really have is. Uh, you know, set up the original context, filter the issues, and paginate. That's the three. The oh, that's sweet, dude. Says uh, Cyber Guy Rich. The uh, VS Live Share, 
Yeah, I was kind of mind. I was blown away by it. It's mind boggling. Uh, I haven't seen it. I think Adam was experimenting with it, the Atom IDE as well. You know, it would really be cool if these if it would be cross platform. Uh, in other words, cross IDE, but it only uh, allows VS Code people to collaborate with VS Code people. I don't know if this is strange or curious or interesting or uh, annoying or anyway, there's some <laughs> way of phrasing this, but uh, my assumption was that for the audio chat in particular, you know, VS Code is basically Chromium browser. As far as I understand, it's like an Electron app. So I would think that they would use, you know, well, what in the browser is there for you to do live audio? Well, WebRTC, I think, right? So I was like kind of assuming that it would be WebRTC underneath. Uh, but then I was like having some troubles with troubleshooting audio, basically, right? Adjusting volume or changing my output or something because I have a headphone sometimes. And I, I was looking at my system sound sources or something, the apps that were using my audio so I could change it to my speakers instead of headphones and it said Skype. <laughs> I was like, I'm not running Skype. I have it installed, but I'm not running it. And it's, um, so apparently somehow internally VS Code Live Share uses Skype, which doesn't surprise me it's a Microsoft thing, but man, I mean, it does, it did surprise me, but it makes sense, but come on, <laughs> just use WebRTC. You don't have any problems with cross-browser WebRTC sessions. Everyone's using Chrome. Chromium. <laughs> That's pretty surprising. All right, so now we're going to do the filter part. For this, I'm going to copy and paste. Maybe I will define a function for this. But in any case, I'm going to copy and paste. So from the memorials, We have this really big gate context function. I'm going to refactor it, in fact. to break in something rich. Cowboy coding. I'm not going to write a unit test for this. Cyberguy Rich says, I agree. If it's using WebRTC, then the audio should be, uh, it should be going through it. Not Skype, but Microsoft is Microsoft, right? <laughs> yeah, man, maybe fact check me on that, but uh, it, yeah, it literally said Skype. Uh, I'm trying to think of whatever, because I was probably using Skype that day, but you know, I'll, I'll make a positive because the audio was coming out my headphones, I think was the case, and I wanted to come out my speakers, and it said Skype, and I changed the audio from headphones to speakers, and it worked, so yeah, but double, double check me on that one. <laughs> And then I need to filter memorials. Use that. Yeah. All right. Filtered and paginated. You know, I might just actually.
I don't know about the argument order here. Filtered memorials, then the request. That's the first time I've done this. Yeah, it's a good refactor. That way it's clear what's going on. So my get context function is a lot more easy to follow. necessarily where this should do. That doesn't matter so much, I suppose. Let's see if it works. So this was all in the memorials. Yeah. Two positional arguments, but three were given. Uh, right, because I need to put self. All right, and there's no page intro text, so that's natural. And there are no memorials. <clears throat> this is where the debugger would come in handy, right? Okay. Oh, no. That's all. It's just I need to return something. That's all. Easy mistake. Yeah. Good, good, good. Refactor. Three minutes, three hours, 33 minutes. Three viewers. I'm closing three issues in this session one pull request. I might be at the, in the home stretch here. I might be able to get this to work. I'm getting a little bit tired, only 10 o'clock though. And I'll eat some il tapala evening evening meal, evening snack. All right, so I did a good refactor there. Let's commit those changes. And I might, again, be able to test this now if I mock this request, essentially. And I might be able to test this if I, if I mock the request and provide a, a um, query set. So yeah. Yeah, that actually makes more sense now. Starting to see the light, so to speak. Now, let's apply the same pattern though. I'm gonna hop back here in full screen mode. Carefully refactor. So what do we have here? So
Okay, first thing we see here is I'm relying on copy and pasted code. Did I bring this in or has this been, where's my, where's my little blame? 25 days ago, I copy and pasted the memorials code in to the magazine and I didn't rename things. Archive issues, dudes, people. So it's a good thing I'm refactoring this, huh? This is actually, yeah. It's gonna be really verbose. This one needs requests. I wonder if there's a cleaner way of doing this. Try accept, accept. I wonder if I should use these exceptions. Well, this is code I borrowed from. Uh, from Simple is Better Than Complex, I think. I was reading a tutorial on it, and it, it was actually using these try-catch blocks to handle the pagination correctly. I'll leave it as that. actually starting to feel like a genuine improvement to the code and my even my working flow I have a better pattern to follow now <clears throat> so what we're doing now is going to take that request in and we're going to filter so that's the other aspect and then in this sense I'm going to just borrow this whole thing it's the exact same pattern and I might be able to anyways I don't want to get too carried away here so it goes filters and paginate. And I'm on the diff view there. So I'll just put the code in sort of the same filtered archive issues. And so the key will be, again, it's coming straight in from the, hmm, deep archive when I filter the key comes in straight from the URL and yeah I have some problems there but that's all right I'll fix those so magazine we're not allowing to filter by title although we could allow that that's cool and insensitive contains now wait a minute this is gonna be a different filter when we're filter oh man if we're mixing I think of what type of filter we're going to use here. Hmm. This is a good experience. We basically have an integer. Equals. If we decide to mix the filters and, for example, allow to be filtered from title, archive issues by title, uh, I'll have a little bit more difficulty here. Let's see if the year I contains approach works. I don't know how fast it'll be. We're not super performance oriented here. Deep archive. Uh, archive issue. And,
Mm. Right. I think this should be fine. So instead of using the children, we're going to be querying against the archive issue uh, model. So that's fine. That works. And let me just move my context stuff to the bottom wherever we're just adding stuff to the context. Maybe. I don't know if that makes sense. Just do all the context manipulation right there in one place so you can kind of get it. Um, Playing with the why, not just the what or how it's doing it. Let's see if this works then. Um, let's look up the yellow text, but if we refresh. Deep archive index page, up again, get paginated issues. So there. This issue should be 1930. Let me just double check. Edit this page. Uh, they're both 1939, so that's, that's very I think I wanted to have different months now. Oh, but wait, I have three issues. Let's pay close attention to that. Because the other ones a really long text. You can see my hacker skills, my lead hacker skills. Um, all right, so we got three things there. Now, if I do 1929, we have one thing. If I do 1930, we have two things. Yes. <laughs> oh man, dudes and dudettes and uh, guys and gals. Overall, it's okay. It's not bad. It's a little blocky. It looks like a Minecraft build. <clears throat> Something. But I guess that's a grid. And uh, magazine issues are rectangular. This, I just wish wasn't so prominent and so padded. Look at that. Goodness me. Where's the computed? Hmm. What's going on with my button? Nothing. Can you change the padding? And if I say, what if I just don't put it in the card? First, let me commit this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ah, uh, yeah, we want a clear filter button, won't we? Uh, which is just basically a link. <laughs> it's kind of good clue to this, but. Uh, yeah, it's just a link to the current page. Uh, so. In other words, if I've got them 1929, I filter it. How do I clear the filter, right? Clear filter. I have this clear search button for that. 
And all it does, oh, it actually does some JavaScript. Yeah, let's keep it consistent at least. I don't know if it's necessarily elegant. So we are in the magazine. Debugger, the next page. So let's just see how this looks in place, firstly. Uh, what the hell? Right, dude, I even have logic to like show and hide it. Hmm. Well, first let me just not make it invisible. Hot reload, need that hot reload. That's one thing Meteor JS actually had out of the box was hot reload. <laughs> That's why it was so appealing. All right, now looks like crap again. No problem. Let's give it a few more columns there. Seven columns. Five columns. And this empty div hack. Just, it is what it is. Don't hate me. All right, it's not too bad. I will make it invisible. I'll just remember the invisible thing. I will fight with the layout later. I want to get the basic functionality in place in a way that's sort of aesthetic. Looks like a Minecraft build, that's okay. More Lego, random Lego blocks of various color. And more soothing colors at that. Now let's copy the JavaScript, the Java, JavaScript. In the extra JS block. And here I'm talking on the invisible if there is a search. So yeah, this is actually I think pretty useful code. Sprinkles of JavaScript is all I've had to use, and that's my main goal is to keep it very simple. Clear filters button, so I do need the ID for that. Alright, so now we know why that was used. ID. We'll call it the clear search button to keep it uh, consistent. I think I would like also to change it. I mean, it doesn't really matter, to be honest. It's just, it should be consistent. So if it's a clear search button, then it's a clear search button. I don't think you literally have to hard code your UI text into the uh, into the code, right, and the attributes, but okay. Yeah, okay. So the, yeah, the elements have the same ID as the search key, and I believe it already does. Actually, let's just we'll click that, that's why. So in the form, we have the select, it has a name and the ID, they both match. This name is passed in on the request, on the get request into the request dictionary. And I pass that directly into Django's query operator. Uh, but I do um, 
validate it. That might be a little bit dangerous if people can construct a request and uh, change the operator. Let me think that through. But I do, again, uh, sanity check that only certain fields are allowed. And then I'm manually, I'm, like it's hard coded that it's an I contains. So you can only query against certain fields. I don't think there's a big potential for abuse here, but I can see why I might not want to use the exact, well, I'm not sure if that's a big deal, to be honest. If anyone watching has uh, any other reservations about essentially query string parameters being matching database keys, the key and the value. Uh, let me know if there's something that could be greatly abused there that comes to your mind. So in your case, the ID and the key match. And if the URL string is present, it'll be, this button will be visible. I don't know if I can just uh, get rid of the columns thing, but I don't know. That's why I wanted this to be a row, but then when I put this in its own row, just stuff was not working very good. So let's go with that. All right, let's make it invisible initially. Clear search works. So if I choose here, go and then there's that. Not too bad, not too bad. And I know there's a page refresh involved here, not Ajaxing it. Uh, might sprinkle in some Ajax with that intercooler JS or something similar, but I'm not going to commit to a full page app, uh, a single page app, I mean, uh, front end framework, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, for a project like this and just in general i'm kind of stepping back from that the idea of single page app being like the way to do it um yeah the ceo uh, cto where i work um, told me that basically one day uh, last year a year ago i had written um a dashboard a data dashboard with this cool project uh, for python called uh, dash it's by plotly had made really good progress and actually cyber guy if you're uh still around uh check this out and they do have an enterprise edition of it so it might uh, at some point be like uh, sort of a sales funnely type thing where you end up needing enterprise features uh for an alternative to that and you probably are aware of these but just in case you're not there's the um bokeh server this is completely run by not numpy there's a foundation that coordinates these projects numfocus this one uh maybe not as polished and not as declarative and reactive and with w magical wiring that uh, plotly dash gives you but both of these are basically ways that you can define interactive data driven applications in python code without writing much html or css so anyways i was uh Long short of it, I was I had done some pretty good work on getting a plotly and dash um, dashboard going up, wired up with some data. But then, basically, I tried carefully, but I was told that essentially you have to that the, that modern developers write single page apps using SPA framework, and uh, uh, that sort of server. I don't know the exact way to phrase it or how it was phrased. But then I had to rewrite the thing instead of using Plotly Dash, I had to write it with an SPA framework. So that meant, well, JavaScript, and that meant, um, it was just, I had to rewrite the thing from scratch. So I did that, rewrite it from scratch. I think we kind of lost out. There's some, Plotly Dash is pretty cool. And it, that's sort of stuck in my mind, among other things, of kind of why I don't really want to do sort of hype driven development, I guess is the right word there's a lot there was a lot of hype with spa paradigm and now it's sort of taken as assumed as like the de facto way of writing apps but i don't think that's entirely true 
This is pretty cool. In any case, if you're doing some data visualization, check out Bokeh Server and Plotly Dash. And also this NumFocus organization has a bunch of cool projects. If you're interested in Python, data science, it's not all Python either, to be honest. It's a R language. Let's see if we got projects. projects. Julia, I mean, JavaScript. It's not a monoculture. We're not trying to build a monoculture in the data science community, right? All of these languages have strengths and weaknesses and are valuable, and we want them to interoperate this is the main goal. And there's a lot of, because we want to get the higher level concerns. We don't want to just be stuck in reinventing the wheel mode and writing assembly language mode, right? That's why we're writing Python. We're writing things, abstractions above low level code, trying to get more uh, closer to the thought, trying to have tooling that helps us to create and experiment at the speed of thinking rather than through some weird build tool or esoteric um, hybrid sort of scripting templating language that, anyway, maybe doesn't follow conventions or reinvented things that were otherwise standardized and kind of had been settled on. Like, we want to keep building up those layers. Project Jupyter is one of those. Hey, uh, CyberGuy, are you using a Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebook when you're doing your uh, Python? Uh, notebook related stuff out of curiosity there's yeah some really cool projects here oh, here's that bouquet which one Jupiter lab or Jupiter notebook or both I guess so didn't end up using this I'm not using masonry Jupiter notebook okay cool have you given Jupiter lab a try it's it's worth it it's no longer sort of alpha software for a while now. It's not been alpha, in fact. Uh, AWS SageMaker, in fact, um, uses Jupyter Lab by default, I think. Now, if you set up a SageMaker instance, uh, you'll get a Jupyter Lab instance as well. So, yes. And one other thing I want to test is that if I arrive on this page with uh, a publication date there, it does auto populate the form. Cool. Yep, it's definitely working now. I'm sorry, repeating myself now. I'm getting kind of tired, but yeah. <laughs> All right, let me know your thoughts on that if you, if uh, if you, if I see another live session after you've tried it out, I'd be curious. It's got some cool extensions like it's got Git integration. It's basically more like an IDE than the Jupyter Notebook experience. Uh, it's got a file browser on the left hand side. Um, let's see if I can open this picture. Copy image address a little bit bigger at least. Um, you know, you can browse your files over here, uh, see what kernels are running and what they're up to. It's got a command palette, so you can uh, remember, helps you remember all those commands. You can search for commands. Um, cell tools, basically when, you know, you're defining cells in your notebook, you can say, well, this one should be a um, slideshow cell or this one should have some metadata on it. Uh, tabs, you can have multiple tabs open. I don't know if you can do that with Jupyter Notebook. I don't think so. Not only that, but you can have multiple view spaces, kind of like subdivisions, you know. Um, so if I, on my IDE over here, I split the split the panel over here, you know, you can do that type of thing. Um, and it doesn't show it here, but you know, you've got a notebook view, a, a data visualization view for perhaps a bokeh interactive, and uh, just a generic Python text editor. Also it does markdown, but it's not showing a cool thing, it's got a built-in terminal. This is running in your browser, by the way, like localhost port 8080 or something. You can open a terminal right inside of your browser and like literally running terminal commands uh, from your browser. I thought that was pretty cool. I hadn't seen that before. Um, maybe it doesn't come with get out of the box. There's some extensions to, uh, for example, auto-generate a table of contents that appears over here and lets you browse. Uh, by clicking on the links and it'll jump you to that section of the notebook. You can get commit and uh, pull and branch and stuff. Man, it's just pretty cool. I think it's some a lot of React in there too, so if you're already comfortable, you could probably dig into the code. And they're very active, the developers. Uh, they, they have been having, let's see, Weekly, weekly meetings online. Yeah, weekly dev meeting. Um, well, 
I'm just going to go to the channel. These are kind of old ones. And pardon my speaker volume, Jupyter Lab Weekly Meeting, Jupyter slash IPython. Here are the community calls. Yeah, check out their, their channel if you want to stay abreast of the development. And these community calls are open. Anybody can, I haven't personally gone to one of them, but I should actually, because I'm so enthusiastic about it apparently. In any case, well, I thought there was more, more recent community calls, but it looks like I'm mistaken. I'm sorry. Uh, August September for a while there when I was when I was following it much more actively than it was a pretty regular schedule. But I think, yeah, these are really good people to be around who are just excellent, really skilled, uh, passionate, you know, doing stuff that, that benefits so many people. I think this is a great community. Cool. The Jupyter Development Guide. Yeah, I should uh, take my own advice. In any case, I got too many big projects right now with sort of tight deadlines I need to be focusing on. Uh, these wagtail type stuff. But from what I can tell, I'm good to go for today. I'll make that commit, describe what I did, and go ahead and sign off for the evening. Mm. Should just be consistent with my naming though. Clear filters. It should be clear search. to go. And I'm just going to go ahead and carefully refactor this. So that the code reflects the UI and the intention. I keep consistency across my layers in terms of like terminology specifically. Like clear, now I need this whole thing. So I'm going to look for that ID. And just test it out real quick. Memorials. Search memorials. I do like this now that the more I think about it. I might, this design, I might just adopt it over there, but uh, let's go ahead and uh, look for someone. It looks like it's good. Yeah, it's still gonna work. Consistency. Oh, cool. 11 commits. What are we? How many hours? Four hours. In there, three issues. Closing. I'm not going to do it right off the bat. One moment. I'm just gonna let this code simmer a little bit, let it settle overnight, let my brain kind of settle down and uh, take a co closer look at what I can achieve in the same pull request or in a new one. But yeah, I don't feel too stressed. I think we made good progress. Um, and didn't leave off with any kind of like, anything hanging un unresolved. 
made some good improvements. Thank you to CyberGuyRich for the code pointers. Um, thank you YetiMuse123 for also helping me out along the way. The recommendation for materialized CSS and also the um, for spotting some errors I was making with my HTML, the markup. Uh, those are always a value. I always value those. CyberGuy, by the way, uh, yeah, let me know if you try out the live share plugin for VS Code. And anyone else um, watching this level two, if you're around, I'm going to start trying to incorporate uh, more. I mean, this is a Code Buddies live coding session, right? So I should be really including. Uh, buddies and people and hang out you know so we are with the chat but it's also kind of like a monologue and I'd prefer to have this not be so like about me but you know it's about showcasing the projects and collaboration and learning from others so yeah I think this VS Code live code extension is going to come in handy for if anybody's interested and in just hanging out in session maybe do an audio chat if you're comfortable with that um, you know moving your cursor around the screen you can actually type in code and stuff like that um, so yeah, I think for people who are more regular, um, uh, sort of regularly active in the chat, uh, I will probably send you whispers, invites to the VS Code Live Share session uh, if you're interested in hanging out that in that way. And Cali Maniac, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for the subscribe. Uh, I hope you have uh, good luck with your. Uh, Python project, I hope you get um, sort of some direction and, and clarity about, uh, you know, if it's going to be a multi-platform app, iOS and Android, and what, what's going to be a good fit for your development workflow. Don't drink and drive, bro. Thanks for the subs or the follow. Thank you very much. I always appreciate having more people around. 8Limbed, thank you for the follow. And Kelly Maniac, I think I might have said this, but thank you also for the follow. It's always good uh, to have more people and hopefully see you all around in the chat. Again, this has been a Code Buddies live coding session. Um, CodeBuddies.org is also being rewritten. The platform itself is open source and we're in the midst of rewriting it in Django. And there's several um, contributors who are very active. I don't have the bandwidth personally to do a whole lot of work on the CodeBuddies.org rewrite, but if you're interested in learning Python and Django or contributing to an open source project, there's going to be a, uh, from what I can tell, based on activity, the community activity, the backend is likely to be in Python and Django. Although uh, we are, they are people are experimenting with their backend technologies, and the front end is likely to be with React. I can't say with 100% certainty. So if you're interested in working with any of those the technologies, and would like to contribute to a really cool open source project and community, check out CodeBuddies.org or GitHub.com/CodeBuddies and we will get you onboarded, get you set up with a development environment and point you towards a couple of low-hanging fruit, some easy tasks. Again, this has been a CodeBuddies.org live coding session. Thank you all for hanging out. If you're watching this on YouTube and you've made it to this end of the uh, session, I appreciate your diligence and let me know if you have any questions or comments below the video. Thanks again and have a great day.